and develops through over applications of fungicides, spraying with a single mode of action throughout the growing season and not alternating or mixing different fungicide groups. Um, I did want to note that resistance can occur under normal field conditions. And so with this performance failure does not always necessarily mean fungicide resistance. Stemphilium is currently considered a medium risk for developing resistance, and fungicides will have differing levels of risk development with um, whatever mode of action they um, have. So, for example, group 11 has high risk of uh, resistance development in pathogens, whereas group M or multi-site fungicides, including mancodes of base products such as dithane, are low risk for resistance development. Um, some spore resistant testing has been performed in 2018 and 2019, as well as 2020. So as you can see with this graph, um, Quadris Top uh, and Luna Tranquility were both tested in 2018. 91% um, of isolates exhibited spore resistance to uh, Quadris Top, and Luna Tranquility had 99% of isolates that had spore resistance. In 2020, uh, a similar trend was seen with 97% of isolates exhibiting spores that had resistance, and all isolates had spores that were resistant to Luna Tranquility in 2020. So resistance hadn't really changed between these two years. It still maintained a high level to both of these fungicides. In relation to spore resistance over time, um, Circadus was evaluated. Um, and tested for isolates from 2012 to 2022. In 2012, there was no isolates that were had spores that were resistant to this fungicide. However, I wanted to note in 2018 to 2022, the amount of isolates that <clears throat> had resistant spores to circadus was around 90 to 100%, and that was maintained in those years. In 2022, we tested spores that were resistant to um, Evergold Prime and Circadus, and of those, 95% of isolates had spores that were resistant to Evergold Prime, and 78% of isolates had spores that were resistant to Circadus. So um, we're following similar trends with resistance seen in other um, fungicides, and um, this is quite concerning considering we only have six fungicides that are registered to be used in rotation. So in summary, fungicides are only partially effective, and this quite possibly could be due to um, fungicide resistance. Um, and this resistance in lab could also, again, be related to the efficacy or lack of efficacy we're seeing for fungicides in fields. Um, <clears throat> it's important to <clears throat> delay resistance by integrating pest management strategies, so um, avoiding spraying when it's not needed, um, alternating different fungicide resistance action groups, and also tank mixing when you're using the same frac groups. Um, I wanted to note that there is high spore resistance for Evergold Prime and Circadus, as demonstrated in the last year. And it's really important to uh, refer to pest management information and for disease risk and spray recommendations. Awesome. Thanks, Emily. So today I'm going to be talking about disease forecasting for stemphilium leaf blight. So quickly, we know the overuse of fungicide leads to resistance. Emily just outlined all of that for you. We know that disease development is influenced by the environment. So for stemphilium leaf blight, we think of things like temperature and leaf wetness duration. As well, we know that accurate forecasting models will provide similar disease suppression as a weekly spray while having fewer spray applications, so saving you, the grower, some money. Looking back in time at two forecasting models that we've tried out, for stemphilium leaf blight, the TomCast and BSBCast model. The TomCast model is designed for tomatoes in Ontario for the pathogen Alternaria. It uses temperature and leaf wetness duration in a daily disease severity value. So each day will have a value from zero to four, four being high disease, zero being no disease pressure. And then you set a threshold. And once that threshold is met after a certain amount of days, you would do a spray and then that would reset. The other forecasting model is BSB cast, which is designed for stemphilium vesicarium on pears based in Spain and Italy. Again, it uses temperature and leaf wetness duration 
but it uses a three-day cumulative risk factor. So looking back at two trials in 2018 and 2019 circled here, we can see higher disease pressure in 2018 than in 2019. These are the results from these two trials. In the beige bars is the 2018 data, and then in 2019 are these green bars. Firstly, noting that in 2018, we have more disease, which makes sense as the uh, bars are taller. 2019 in green, the bars are lower. There, what I wanna focus on for this graph is the amount of sprays uh, for each of the treatments. So the two treatments controls were with a C treatment and without, and that's penflufen or Evergold Prime. As well, I wanna focus on the BSB cast calendar and TomCast 15 models. We see the calendar predicting seven sprays each season, which makes sense. And we see the BSB cast model recommending six and five and the TomCast recommending five and six. So from this data, we can see that we have too many sprays, especially in 2019 in this low disease year. Moving ahead to the 2021 fungicide timing trial, again, looking at these different forecasting models, the only statistical difference was the control without seed treatment having more disease than the rest of the treatments. So anything that had penflufen as a seed treatment was not different. So in this case, it didn't matter how many sprays we applied, it didn't make a difference for disease severity. So the important thing to look at for 2021 was how many sprays we had for each year. So TomCast with a higher threshold had three sprays, which shows an improvement. The BSB cast had six sprays, which was the same as the calendar, and the TomCast 15 with a slight improvement of four sprays, which two less than the calendar. So all of this uh, goes to show that we still are predicting too many sprays with these forecasting models. So we need something that's more improved for conditions in Ontario. So that led me to trying two different models. The first is STEMCAST, which is a variation of the TomCast model, more specific for stemphilium leaf blight in Ontario. So that means warmer temperatures and longer leaf wetness durations to initiate the same spray. And it uses also that same daily disease severity value. The other model I wanted to try was a spore threshold model, and this was trying to answer the question, can we use the amount of spores in the air to predict our first spray? This is based off the idea that if there are no spores in the air, there's no disease. So these are the two spore traps that I use in season to uh, count the amount of spores in the air. This is the Burkhard volumetric spore trap, and this is the Rotorod spore sampler. Moving ahead to the results from the 2022 uh, forecasting trial, we saw no differences between any of the treatments in terms of disease severity. And that's uh, due mostly because it was a low disease year. So again, because there's no statistical differences, we want to know how many sprays we were able to save by using our new forecasting models. So the calendar, I'll start off there, had six sprays. Again, pretty typical from what we've seen the past seasons. The TomCast 15 had five sprays, so only one less. We did see an improvement with the STEMCAST model having three sprays, so three less than the calendar, and the Canidia threshold had two sprays. Now, I will note that the threshold that I set was not reached until the very end of July, so then there was one spray and then a spray weekly right after that, so there were only two, and this is not something I would necessarily uh, recommend for you growers, but uh, still this is data that we're looking at improving in the future. I want to just show two graphs on the top is 2021 and the bottom is 2022 looking at some trends. This is disease severity over time and we can see a steady increase throughout the growing season. And then in 2022 we can see this increase but then it almost levels off uh, midway through the growing season so we have less disease. First looking at uh, spore data. We can see an increase here in 2021 at the end of June, and then an increase throughout the end of the growing season. And in 2022, we do see less amount of spores and especially uh, less around the end of June area. Looking at the rotorod in green here, again, very similar trend, a few spores around this time, and then it increases towards the end of the growing season. And in 2022, similarly, less amount of spores. 
So from this data, we can see um, disease severity increasing for the most part, and then we see our spore concentrations increasing. So we're still evaluating if this can be used effectively for a forecasting model. These red bars represent high risk stem cast days. So these are days where the daily disease severity value was a three or above. You can see more of these in 2022 than in, or sorry, in 2021 than in 2022, which makes sense. And I wanna compare that to the high risk Tom cast days. Again, we see a lot more of these days in 2021 than in 2022. And any day that we had a high risk stem cast day, we also had a high risk Tom cast day. So should we use weather or spore trapping for our forecasting model? From the weather, we've seen improvements using the stem cast having less high risk days in both 2021 and 2022, and especially having less in 2022 in a low disease year, which is good. So the stem cast seems to be showing improvement, especially in these low disease years. What about spore trapping? Again, we saw more spores at the end of the growing season in both years. And so this seems to show that as disease is increasing, we see spore concentrations following. So we're still trying to evaluate if this is going to be the best use as a predictor, um, but this is still uh, data that we like to look at. So what's the prediction? I think it's gonna be a good combination of both looking at the weather and perhaps getting a lower spore concentration threshold that's accurate each year. Some tips though, uh, for all of you that we don't leave here uh, with nothing from this part, I would say look and monitor the IPM reports that are sent out to all of you. And if you have, uh, if you look at the TomCast values, if you see low amounts of the cumulative DSI, if that's increasing slowly, that probably means we have low uh, disease pressure in our fields. And again, if you see high DSI numbers and high increases in that cumulative DSI, we probably have higher or more risk for disease pressure, especially early in the growing season. So in summary, it's important to apply fungicides before infection takes place. We see the stem cast model showing improvement in 2022. Stem filling fungicides are specific. Not all our registered fungicides are effective. I'd like to acknowledge all of our funding and also technical assistance from Kevin Vanerkoy, Tyler Blau, the station at the Ontario Crops Research Centre Bradford, and also our committee members, Dr. Bruce Gosen, Dr. Mary Ruth McDonald, Dr. Cheryl Truman, and Dr. Jennifer Foster. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions for either Mike or Emily. Um, Circadus was applied as a full year application for um, the fungicide efficacy trials. They were not. They were just done with <clears throat> the single active ingredient. It was just easier to present them as the mixture, but it was azoxystrobin and fluopyrim that was tested. Yeah, one of your earlier slides, you had said that the check plot, there was no difference between all the spray and the check plot. No, no fungicides were applied in the check plots. So we have fungicides that are resistant and not very effective, but every year we seem to have a little bit less disease. So why did we get less disease in the last year, three or four years, even though we didn't get effective? Why do you think that happened? Hmm. Do you want me? Yeah, what she said. Oh, yeah, no, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, that's a good point. Um, I think probably a bit of a combination or whether we're seeing uh, less high risk days like we saw in 2022, but I think the spore data also 
probably show something. So that something will look more into previous years, comparing how many spores we were seeing earlier in the growing season, especially. How much rain did you get after May 2 for it? Like it was pretty dry last year. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know the exact amount we had after that, Kevin. Would you know off the top of your head how much rain we received? Uh -oh. Okay, stay tuned for Tyler. He will uh, be talking more about that. Any other questions? We have we have time. Awesome. All right. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Our next speaker will be uh, speaking on battling Stemphilium leaf blight and onion in the face of fungicide resistance in New York. Let's welcome Christy Hopting. Thank you so much for uh, coming up north. Hello, everyone. It's so good to be back. <laughs> what a wave of nostalgia when I walked into the door this morning. Um, I was uh, I was a summer student here in 1996 and a graduate student 1999 to 2000. Um, I've been in New York ever since. So um, I got my start in onions here and the Holland Marsh will always be very near and dear to my heart. So um, the title that I gave to Kevin, Battling Stemphilium Leaf Blight and Onion in the Face of Fungicide Resistance in New York. The first draft of the title that I had, I didn't send him, was limping along with broken fungicides trying to control Stemphilium Leaf Blight in New York. I, for what I just heard from you guys, we're all in the same boat, so I'm not all by myself. Uh, managing Stemphilium, uh, managing Stemphilium with fungicides is like whitewater rafting, and I can't freaking keep my fungicides in the boat, and they just keep floating down the river. I try to throw them a rope, and they just can't get it, and it's an adventure, let's call it that. Um, okay, so what I have for you today is actually a lot of information, as always. Um, I'm going to just take you through the journey of the past 10 years and how resistance has developed and the, the results from the fungicide trials, how we tweaked our fungicide programs, and how the heck are we um, doing these days. Um, I have a handout, Sean, in that, or Travis, in that box there. So don't worry, you'll have all the information. Um, I'm going to go through stuff quickly. And I'm, you can hand, you can hand them out now, yeah. Um, oh, dear. Sorry. <laughs> yes, white water rafting. <laughs> okay, um, I could I could just hold it. I could just yeah. Okay, all right, I'll do this. Okay, so I am coming from the the perspective of extension. So I am running a fungicide program. So I or a scouting program. So I am walking onion fields every single week. So I have the perspective of what the disease is doing on a weekly basis in grower farms. And I'm also doing on-farm fungicide trials. Okay, and I have to acknowledge, I am not in New York all by myself, thank goodness. But we have tremendous support from Dr. Sari Pathabridge and Frank Hay. And um, particularly Daniel Heck has been a postdoc working on Stemphilium the last, I think, four years now. And then Natalie is a, uh, a master's student working on Stemphilium as well. And I think you may have had um, Frank or Daniel come here as guest speakers. So you may know them. Um, and we have got a decent amount of funding from the federal level, USDA, federal capacity funding as well. Our growers have an association. They've got skin in the game. They're funding it. And I highly value my relationships with private industry working together to develop products. I am always looking for a new mode of action for Stemphilium. And I have some support as well. I've got a couple technicians that can help me out. All right. So Emily did a great job of talking about um, the symptoms of the disease. And I just, there's a couple of things I want to go over. So I think about Stemphilium in three parts. Number one, it's the target spot lesions, which are very showy, very diagnostic. But then it also includes spore colonization of necrotic leaf tip tissue or actually necrotic tissue in general. And I have termed this dirty tips. Um, so it can be just a subtle dan tan discoloration. And then when the disease becomes more primary and you get more spores, it can become more black. Oopsie daisies. Um, so 
in the fungus in the fungicide trials, um, how I evaluate stemphilium, it's kind of a complex disease to evaluate. It's constantly evolving. I used to try to estimate percent spore colonization per necrotic necrotic leaf tissue. And that was just really hard on the brain to be constantly judging percent colonization. So we simplified that because if your brain is tired, your data is going to be less accurate. So we're always trying to get accurate data. So we came up with a simple um, severity, zero to five point scale, zero, the chips are clean. One, we're starting to see some tan. Two, less than 50% tan. Three, um, more than 50% tan. Four, we're starting to see some black spores. Five, we're seeing a lot of black spores. So very simple. And then the other component of symphilium is leaf dieback. So the pathogen produces the toxin that causes the, leaves, the leaf to become necrotic and die. And they, that can be independent of the spot. So I have had fungicide treatments that they're, they, the fungicide can't keep the leaves green. Um, but I'm not seeing a lot of spots or I can, I have a treatment where I've got nice green foliage, but it's full of spots. So I am keeping all of these categories separate in my evaluations now. And when leaf dieback becomes excessive to the point where the onions die standing up. So the foliage is so lightweight, doesn't have the weight to lodge properly. Um, I, I guess improper lodging failure to lodge, we call it dying standing up. Um, this obviously is going to take a bite out of yield. And we did a study several years ago where we found that when the onions die standing up, we had twice as much incidence of bacterial rot. So not only do you have small bulbs, you have small bulbs rotten and nobody wants that, right? So um, I, my goal is to what I call land the crop when we're scouting, did we land it or did it die standing up? Um, but what, what I've noticed in my fungicide trials is that we see the greatest treatment separation after lodging in the, in the rate at which the leaves die back. So at what point does the amount of green foliage in a crop that is lodged have an effect on yield? So last year we set up a trial, or I should say 2021, we set up a trial. So at two weeks after the last fungicide spray, which we usually put on at 50% lodging, so the onions are lodged and they've got different levels of green tissue. 33%, 57%, and 85%. And then we let them dry down naturally. So two weeks later on September 17th, we, we pulled these onions. So there's no green left in anything. And when you tug on them, the roots are letting go. They're ready to come out. Whereas when we evaluated the green here, you tug on them, they're still hanging on. Okay, and what we, what we got is these differences are not significant, but numerically we had a 10 to 13% yield bump when we had 57 and 85% green compared to 33, which in this trial was 65 to 8,400 weight per acre. So I'm kind of coming in at when you're two weeks after your last fungicide spray, which went on at 50% lodging, you want to have 50% or more green foliage. Otherwise you could be looking at a 10% yield drag or more. Okay, now I wanna talk about secondary versus primary symptoms or the disease in general. So stemphilium can act as a secondary pathogen. It can, it likes to invade necrotic tissue. And when we're scouting fields, it looks like it is perfectly happy to stay in that necrotic tissue. It's not interested in bothering anything else. So here's some example of where we see secondary looking stemphilium. So this is, would be a buctral burn. Um, we've got brown, we've got tan, there's no targets in here, there's no spores, it's just tan discoloration. Um, if I send this leaf to Frank Hay, he's going to find some phyllium spores on it. Here is um, goal injury that's grown out. So you know the two leaf stage, two, three leaf, you got that pigtailing. This is like a, a six or seven leaf onion and that pigtail has grown out. It's just a bent onion leaf. And we see these beautiful purple lesions in there. The rest of the crop, totally fine. Tips are clean, but it looks like it's just being a secondary attacking that necrotic tissue. We also have a lot of iris yellow spot virus in New York, especially in Alba. I don't know how much of a problem that is here. That these, these are examples of stemphilium coming in on iris yellow spot lesions. And then um, we know that stemphilium likes to chase downy mildew. So downy mildew will infect green, healthy tissue, then it will kill it. And then the stemphilium comes in on that necrotic spot. So then you're dealing with a downy mildew stemphilium complex. So 
particularly when you're evaluating a fungicide trial. And if you have downy mildew in that fungicide trial and your different treatments have different levels of control in downy mildew, it's gonna confound your data. So we, in our fungicide trials, I keep any secondary SLB separate and I can either combine them or not. And I've honestly, I've made a decision where I'm just looking at, I'm not even looking at secondary lesions anymore. Unless the herbicide injury is uniform or the IYSV is uniform or whatever else, that could be variable among treatments and it can just confound the results. So to me, what primary stymphilium is, is when we see the distinct target lesions, we're starting to see the concentric rings, we see spores, we see greasy water-soaked tissue, it is breaking down green tissue. When we see any color of target, any color of target lesion, otherwise green tissue, um, and then of course we, here's an example of primary. It is showy. It's purple. It's black. The tips are dirty. They're full of spores. We've got excessive leaf dieback. So to me, that's the difference between secondary and primary infection. So when we're, when we're, uh, evaluating or talking about stemphilium, we're putting it into the different categories. What color of lesions and is it on green or necrotic, necrotic tissue? What's the situation with the tip colonization? Is it tan tips? Is it black tips? Is it, does it look primary or secondary? And then in the field, we look at percent tip burn or per, which eventually becomes percent leaf dieback. And in fungicide trials, we actually tend to look at it the other way and evaluate percent green foliage. And so here's an example of a scouting report. Um, so 41% of the tips infected, 36% of targets for a total of 77% incidents. And they're all, it's tan and purple on necrotic tissue. SLB appears secondary. Here's another scouting report. 28% um, tips, 72% targets, tan, purple, um, purple on necrotic, purple on green, tan on green, black on necrotic. And then we actually had 32% of the plants had purple target spots, 100% incidents, some primary SLB, not hard to find target spots. So my fungicide recommendation between these two scouting reports could very well be different. And then for the fungicide trials, you can take those categories and then you can do percent total SLB, percent targets. You can do the severity, the tip severity scale, um, what percentage of plants, plants of primary infection, your green foliage per plot, depending on how bad things get, you can do percent dying out, dying standing up, and then your bulb size distribution and yield. Okay, so I'm going to talk a lot about fungicides. Um, and rotating mode of action, mo rotating chemical classes. I like talking in numbers. What does SDHI stand for? How do you say fluoro, I can say fluoropyrone. I can't, I can't never pronounce the frag seven in, uh, in Maravon. So, so for me and working with my growers, we are um, spraying by number. So this is frac group seven, for example. And it, FRAC7 has 10 different subclasses. So they are all attacking the same mechanism in the pathogen, but a different subclass may be going after a different enzyme or something like that. And potentially you may or may not have cross resistance between the different subclasses. At least we were really hoping. Um, so I just started numbering the different sub subclasses one, two, three. And it just so happens that Luna, Maravon, and Endura slash pristine, pristine, they all belong to different subclasses. Now, if we've got products with active ingredients within the same, different active ingredients in the same subclass, I coded those ABCs. So we're rotating our one, two, threes and our ABCs. If only it was really that simple. Okay, I'm gonna, these are a list. And so this is gonna be in your handout, a list of a lot of the different products that we are working on. They can change names as they cross borders, sometimes, we have different premixes than you do. Um, so that's in your handout. And I just wanted to point out, I'm gonna talk about Viathon a lot. That's a Helena product, which is Tebuconazole, a FRAC3 with phosphorus acid, which is a P07. So I don't know if you've Helena, if you have this. Um, and then the P07 by itself, just phosphorus acid. I was using Rampart, Reveille, um, but there are several products like that. And the Miravis, we have Miravis Prime, which is, the FRAC7, you know, whatever, however you pronounce that. And then it's with Flutioxinol, which is a FRAC12. So I don't know what your Miravis duo is, but we are a 7 and a 12. 
All right. So let's go down. Let's go down the journey. Let's go back to 2013. So back then, our FRAC three and sevens were the top performers in fungicide trials. And I will say, we did not have, we might have had Quadris top at that time. Um, we would have had Endura, but we didn't have Luna. We didn't have Maravon. We didn't have Fontalis. We didn't have any of those in the field. So the grower fields, the onions are dying, standing up. They're wondering what's going on. Fungicide trials are showing that the threes and sevens are the top performers. So Luna Tranquility, Maravon, Endura, Quadris top, Inspire Super. This is when we started to notice that FRAC 9 Scala, I don't know if you guys have Scala, was starting to slip. So that used to be our go-to fungicide for keeping the onions green, keeping the disease out. That's starting to slip. FRAC 2 Roverall, also not looking so good. In 2015, so growers were asking me, do I need to use Quadris or does it have to be Quadris Talk? And I'm like, I don't know. I evaluated Quadris Talk. So in 2015, I took all those premixes and I looked at all the separate components and it became very clear that the 11s were not doing anything. Um, so that is when we identified that we had fungicide resistance to FRAC 11s and they tested it for the gene mutations and they were present. So FRAC 11s, broken, broken, broken. Can't get them to do anything for SLB. They, we still use them as a protectance against downy mildew. So 2017, now we've got Luna Tranquility. We've got Maravon. We've got these great sevens labeled now. So we were putting programs together. Um, we're, we're trying to use as much three and seven as we can within the, the limits of the labels. So we were never using more than two apps before rotating. We were never exceeding the maximum use rate per active ingredient or per frac group in the per season. We were following all the rules. Frac had listed, um, frac had rated threes as moderate risk for resistance. The sevens were moderate to high, nines moderate, 11 was high. We'd been using strobies in onions for well over 10 years before they developed resistance. So we thought if we followed the rules, we were good. And we were rotating subclasses of sevens. So this is me in 2017. I am jumping for joy. I have found the solution to this disease. It was a cool, wet year. Disease pressure was high. The FRAC 7 and 3 programs, we called them Cadillac programs, they were doing well. We had excellent disease control. We had big bulbs and big yields. And this was my 20th year in onions and the best crop I'd ever seen in 20 years. So that was the high. <laughs> glug, 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 glug. <laughs> All right. 2017, we started evaluating our fungicide trials. What do we see? Um, Endura and Pristine are significantly better than nothing, but not great. They are not front runners. They have fallen out of the boat and they are floating down the river. Luna Tranquility, best in trial. Maravon, second place. Um, so those are... All of those are three different subclasses and they are performing differently. So we were really hoping that it was just an Endura problem and that Luna Tranquility was gonna hold on, that it was in a different subclass and it was gonna keep going. Um, and then we, Roverall and Scala by themselves were not great, significantly better than nothing, but not great. Um, but, this is where I started my onion fungicide dating service. So now I'm trying to put together different products and see who's going to be a power couple. Turns out Rover and Scala were just lonely and they didn't want to be alone. This, so this is my new power couple. So they came in second place. They were as good as, um, as, as a Mar Maravon or uh, I forgot to mention the frac threes have fallen into second place at this point too. Okay. In 2018, Luna Tranquility is still best in trial. We see Maravon slip again. It's definitely, I threw it a rope, but didn't catch it. It's still going down the river. I started stacking frac threes. And th this is because this is some of my growers were doing. So I'm like, well, let me trial it. Well, Quadris Topless Tilt was as good as Luna Tranquility and significantly better than single frac three products alone, which were now middle of the pack. Scala plus Roverall, um, mediocre. The couple is fighting, they're starting to break up. And that varied by region. It was performing better in Elba than in Oswego, than in Oswego, I'll say that. Okay, so 2019, now FRAC 7, FRAC 7 single products, 
And I'm putting Maravon in this category because it's a premix with an 11 and 11s are broken, right? So it may as well be a seven by itself. Endura and then Kenja, this is a sub, I think this was like the fourth or fifth subclass that I um, tested. So any single frac seven um, was looked like an untreated check. And that's when the lab finally caught up and checked to see if the genes had the conferred resistance were detected and they detected that. Um, FRAC three plus three, quadrostropos tilt, best in the trial. And oh no, <laughs> Luna Tranquility has slipped into second best or mediocre. Um, so I'll just talk a little bit about this FRAC seven fungicide resistance. So here we are looking at the um, insensitive isolates. So this is um, this is based on the, the plate assays. So 2016 to 2020, in four years, four years, this just exploded. And this is showing, this is by region here, but um, Daniel detected 11 different types of FRAC7 mutations. That's a lot. <laughs> they're pro they're broken. So probably um, you know, that Luna was gonna hold on and endura falling apart. It was just a subclass thing because it was a different gene that mutated. No, all the genes are mutating. And we did identify cross resistance among the different subclasses. So the isolates that were insensitive to Luna were also insensitive to Maravon, were also insensitive to Endura, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and then here you can just see this is the the in the increase in mutation in the isolates from 2016 to 2018. So you can see there are some categories like this, I don't know, snot yellow and peach, whatever you want to call these colors, seem to be the dominant ones. And interestingly, they they vary by region a little bit. Um, and then here is the sensitivity data. And for whatever reason, these dominant gene mutations also confer the highest levels of resistance. So these sevens couldn't be more broken. How do they relate to fungicide use? So I've got the scouting program. I know what the growers are doing. So what we're looking at is a scale from never to always for the 2017, 2018, the number of fun or the, per the, per the proportion of fungicide programs that use more than three apps of FRAC7 per season. So I should say once we developed the power, once we discovered the power couple, scale up plus row overall, so the nine and the two, we were rotating, we were rotating nine and two, three, seven, and ideally no more than two apps per frac. It often ended up no more than three apps per frac. So we did a lot better job with rotating. Um, anyway, so here's the profile. Um, so Wayne County never ever used more than three apps, three apps of frac seven. Oswego about 60%, Alba about 80%. So heavy usage of FRAC 7s. And they have the same profile. So what, you, you said three is too much? Two is too much? Like, it seems like it doesn't matter what we did, the pathogen was going to develop resistance to the 7s. Crazy. Okay, 2020. We had a new front runner in our trials. It was Viathon plus Tilt. So a three plus three. And the Viathon, as I mentioned before, is a premix with P07. I also found a synergy between Luna Tranquility and Rovrol. So Rovrol was one of these treatments that was keeping it green, but still had spots. Luna was struggling to keep it green, but seemed to still not have as many spots. So I'm like, why don't I try to put those two together? And it worked. 2020 is the first time we saw FRAC3 alone completely failed, fail in, in the fungicide trials. So I'm going to show you some results here. So the way I set up my trials, the treatments are in order from left to right, from best to worst. I flank off in the front what's not significantly different than the best treatment. And in this case, there was one that was better than everything else. So I put in a second place. And then on the other end, what's not significantly different than the worst treatment. We're looking at green foliage here um, at the end of the season, a week after that last spray went on. Here's the untreated. Ideally, you're untreated as the worst treatment. Um, that's not always the case. So here's the quadrus tropolis tilt, our frac three plus three in second place. And then here's the Luna products, different rates, different formulations. Um, I tested Luna all the way up to 24 ounces. I, I, I tested it from eight to 24 ounces, no rate relationship. It's broken. 
Um, but it's significantly better. It's kind of in that middle of the pack, significantly better than nothing, but not great. Trying to be something, but you know, um, and then here's Scala by itself, which is the premix with Luna. It's not doing much, but for some reason, um, that premix is doing better than the sevens by themselves. Here's Miravis Prime, not significantly different from Luna, but numerically, trial after trial, it seems to be doing a little bit better than Luna Tranquility. And that's a premix with a 12. And then here are the Frac 7 single products. So Maravon and Kenja looking absolutely not different than an untreated. And this was an interesting data set. This is from, these are isolates collected from a fungicide trial. These are fungicide sensitivity testing. So the farther to the, the farther to the right, that's the farther down the river. That's the more, the higher proportion of insensitive isolates. So if you've got isolates that are going to respond to the fungicide, you're going to see this bell curve all tight and skinny pushed up against the zero of the, of the X axes, right? So you can see they're all kind of floating down the river. I flagged the 50% here. This is two rates of Maravon, not seeing a rate relationship. These are two rates of Luna Tranquility. And you can see that we've got more insensitive isolates in Maravon than we did in Luna. So that reflects the fungicide trial results. And then this orange line here, that is just the fluopyrum or the FRAC7 in Luna by itself. Look at that. It's a lot more insensitive than in the Luna Tranquility. So that nine appears to be guarding against resistant, helping hold it up, whatever you want to call it. The, the premix with the nine seems to be helping. All right, so here's, here's Luna by itself. Here's Roverall by itself. This trial, it's not really that green. These two kind of need help. Put them together. Look at that. Look at that synergy. That's as good as a three plus three. So started using um, FRAC7 premixes with Roverall. Um, and then here's our front runner. So this is Viathon plus Tilt, which carries that P07, um, significantly better than um, Quadrus Chop plus Tilt. All right, here, so in 2021, we tried to figure out, is it the active ingredient in Viathon, the Tebuconazole? Or is it the P07 that's helping us get significantly better control? So this is the, the tebuconazole by itself. Significant, we're looking at green foliage, significantly better than nothing, but not great. Here's the P07 by itself, keeping the onions green, doing a little something. Here's the combination in Viathon. Not significantly different, but numeric. It's significantly better than the FRAC3, not numer uh, numerically different than the P07. Here is Sevia, okay? Sevia just got labeled. I think a year ago, we nobody had ever sprayed Sevia and onions. Here, here's cross resistance for you. It, it was broken before we even got it. Not different than an untreated. Um, here, we're putting it with the P, P07. This is a tank mix. It's as good as a Viathon. So we do believe that the P07 is what is helping keep those onions green. And there's Viathon, which is a single three. Viathon plus tilt, significantly better than a single three. And then here, three plus three plus three, I added quarters top to that. Um, numerically better, not statistically better. So we're seeing a bump when we go from a single to a double, not when we go from a double to a triple. Okay, 2021, 20, 22. Um, so our best performing tank mixes are Viathon plus Tilt, a three plus three plus a P07, and the Frac 7 premixes, so either Lunar Tranquility or Miravis Prime, plus Roverall, which is a frac two. So you can only use Viathon and Tilt twice. You can play that card twice. And then you got maybe two more cards to play with the sevens. That's only four. And if you want to cheat and do more than two and go into three, I kind of recommend cheating on the sevens because they're as broken as they're going to get. You can't break them anymore. So if you're getting any utility out of them, use them. But the threes, we're still trying to save. Anyway, so the point is you don't have many cards to play of really good performing products. Um, we did get around, not we, the lab got around to testing, are the, do the FRAC threes have the gene mutations that confer to fungicide resistance? Not detected. So that means that the insensitivity that we are seeing is by another mechanism. So maybe the, path, maybe the isolates are detoxifying the fungicide at a more rapid rate. Maybe they are producing the enzymes that the FRAC3 targets. 
to compensate. We don't know exactly what's going on, but that may explain why when we stack threes, we are starting, we see a difference in control. When I rack up the rate of sevens, I don't see that. When I rack up threes, I'm seeing at least to a point. What started to separate out is that among the different active ingredients of threes, getting slightly different performance among them, and I'll show you a graph. Um, I think the data is starting to trend that we are seeing better control when you're using two different active ingredients of frac threes together versus just using a 2x rate of a single active. So mixing active ingredients, take mixing, mix, take mixing active ingredients seems to help. Um, and we did identify that the P07 does have activity on stemphilium in addition to plant health. And we have identified FRAC 19 and maybe 12 may have some utility that we can use in a program. Okay, so very quickly, this is the FRAC 3 stuff. Um, so we are looking at by region, Alba, Oswego, Wayne, Orange, the tebu diphenoconazole, tebuconazole, and propoconazole. Green indicates the proportion of sensitive isolates where the fungicide should be working. Yellow is moderately resistant. Um, orange is highly resistant. So at a glance, it appears that diphenoconazole should have more activity. These two, it's hard to tell which is worse of the two. This one's got more orange. This one has less green, whatever. So it looks like diphenoconazole seems to be the better one. And if you want to look at the difference by regions, it looks like Elba and Wayne have the same profile, which have more sensitive isolates than Oswego, which have more uh, sensitive isolates in Orange County. Here, this is an example of tebuconazole by region and then over time since 2016. So you can see we have quite a bit, quite a drop from 2018 to 2020. And then in Elba and Wayne, we're almost flatlining between 20 and 2021. So we've backed off on our fungicide use. And I'm like, is that enough? Are we rotating enough? Can we flatline this? Can we just stay where we are, please? I threw your rope. Hang on. We can bring you back in. Um, Oswego County, they're still going down. They didn't grat catch the rope. Orange, my God, they're down the, they've gone down the waterfall. They're done. Um, and I will say I work in these regions. So I have no control as to what these growers are doing. Um, okay. So the same thing for the other active ingredients. Does that relate to fungicide use? Let's, let's take a look at that. So what we have here are the number of FRAC3 sprays per season, zero to five. I've color-coded in red, four and five. We're looking at 2017 through 2021 in Elba, Wayne, and Oswego counties. So Oswego County with the, with the fungicide testing in the laboratory had the highest number of insensitive isolates. And there's the most red here. They have the highest FRAC3 use. Uh, you know, 50, 30, 50% of the programs using four or five apps of frac three in a season. So Alba and Wayne County have very similar fungicide sensitivity profiles with the assay results, but clearly we had used a bit more frac threes, at least historically. You can see we've really backed off in Alba. Wayne County, um, there some some of the program weren't even using, some of the growers weren't even using frac threes. And yet we ended up in the same place. I'm like, seriously, we can't use one or two? Because I just really wanted to use two. Honestly, I want to use three. Um, so anyway, that's interesting. Okay, so here's what I wanted to show you. This is last year's data, 2022. We're looking at target spots. This, this is, this is um, tebuconazole, or sorry, diphenoconazole. So this is Inspire. This is what's, in, this is by itself, not in a premix. This is Sevia. So another active ingredient. This is tebuconazole. This is in Viathon. All of these, not significantly different than the untreated. This is tilt. Propoconazole, the one we've had the longest. Um, not different than our front runner. And then I feel like I got to hurry here. So I'm, I'm not going to go through, I'm not going to go through all these details. This in your handout, but this is getting at that um, tank mixing, Two different actives seems to be better than just increasing the rate of a single active. And we're not really seeing a jump from a two product, or a two product three C tank mix compared to a three. So I'm just going to fly through that in the essence of time. It's on your handout. Okay. 
Here is the FRAC 19, the OSO data from last year. So I've actually been looking at OSO a lot. It doesn't keep the leaves green. It looks like, it kind of looks like a loser. Um, so last year I teamed it up with P07. I'm like, let's keep the leaves green and let's see if it controls the spots. So this is our target spot data. There's the untreated. This is the P07 by itself. Um, you know, 33% reduction. Um, significantly better than nothing, but not great. It looks like it does have some activity. Here I take mix it with the half rate of OSO. Um, it's not significantly different than the front runner, which is uh, a three plus three, Carter Swap or still, Biathon plus still is in here. Um, so not significantly different than the P07 by itself, but when I use the high rate, that is significantly better. So these results suggest that this actually does have some activity against reducing the number of spores. So from 50, 57% down to, to 17. So that's, that's pretty good. This, this, this treatment's right up there. This is like 80% control. All right. And then here's the green foliage data. So you can see it's, it's not helping. It's not helping with the keeping the plants green. So that was, that was what was expected. And then FRAC 12. Um, so here's the target spot data. It's in that significantly better than nothing, but not great category. Um, which in this case wasn't significantly different than the front runner. Um, so it may have some activity. And then here's the green foliage. It was keeping the plants green a little bit. Um, I had another trial in Oswego and it can, or the FRAC 12 uh, cannonball was the product I used. It kept the foliage green, but it had spots. So I'm not sure what exactly is going on with that. I'm going to try take a look, closer look at that one. Um, okay. So this is my last data slide. So a program, obviously, okay, what are, we, what are we doing? How can we keep, how can we keep these onions? How can we land this crop so they don't die standing up? So here's my program. It is, it's in the front runner section. We're doing okay. What did we do? So we are starting the season with Mancozeb. Um, this controls Botrytis. We're really going after Botrytis halos. Bravo is not compatible with our insecticide. So these are going out with Movento. And then usually we get what I call the, the momentum of Movento. We can take a week off before we have to put another fungicide in. So then we'll go with Bravo predominantly going after um, Botrytis, but this is Bravo, significantly better than nothing, kind of a middle of the pack. It's got some activity on SLB. Then we went to Miravis Prime. Um, this is good Botrytis activity. Uh, here's how it, how, here's how it performed by itself in this trial. So it's, it's got a little something, um, probably coming from the 12 and then, then we did the Viathon plus chill. So this is one of our best, this is playing our cards of our best performers. So this is around one inch bulbing, like just, and when do we start the spray program? I'm so happy to hear that you're catching spores because I would love to know how many spores are in there. Cause I'm totally shooting from the hip. When do we play these? When do we play our, our, our best shots? Because we only have four. Um, so we want to set ourselves up for success. And this is when we're starting to see tip burn. I'm like, I don't feel comfortable not having a good SLB product on this crop anymore. Usually everybody tends to pull the trigger around then. So we're not at three to four leaf. We're at one inch bulbing just when we're starting to see tip. And it depends what we're seeing in scouting too. So 2021, we had a lot of rain mid-July. We were absolutely coming on with our Viathon until last year. We were pushing it. We were trying to wait a little longer because we know the disease is going to ramp up in August when we get the nighttime dews, same as with downy mildew going into September. So we want to save at least three applications for the last three sprays if, if we need them. Okay, so that's the bio, first Viathon. Then I'd already got a peek at my research results. So I did an Oso plus Rampart, take a break from our sevens and our threes. Then I played the FRAC 7, um, FRAC 7 premix with Roverall. Then I went back to Viathon plus Tilt. So I have no more FRAC threes, ideally. I would love to end the spray program right here. I would love to leave it there. A lot of my growers did, no more than two apps per FRAC. This field went long and I just had to come up with something and I just threw the book at it. And honestly, I wouldn't do this again, knowing what I know now. I'd probably finish that with maybe a, a, an OSO of FRAC 19. There's no point putting three threes on. I don't want to, I don't want to select for resistance anymore. I'm done. No more sevens, no more threes. That should have been something different. So if you can run a program up to spray H here, no more than two apps for FRAC. That's what we're trying to do. Okay. Um, 
So these are in your handout. I'm not going to go over, I'm not going to go over all the details. It's basically just the written version of all the points that I've hit. Um, but I did want to, I did want to mention that these are products that have completely failed, have no activity for stemphilium in our trials. Mancozab, the BM01, specifically I've trialed tea tree oil and lifeguard. BM02, specifically I've trialed double nickel, seraphil, dia, and howler. Frac 21, which is supposed to be good on um, alternaria. It, it definitely does not have activity on stemphilium. And thyme oil, which doesn't even have a frac group. Um, so all of those products have had no activity on stemphilium. Um, and then, yeah, I, and here I just wanted to mention that every time you spray a frac two, a three, a nine, a seven, anything that has moderate to high risk for developing resistance, you are selecting for resistance. So, you know, again, would love to know how many spores are in the air, um, when to play, when to play those cards. Um, but really working with my growers, let's take, let's take advantage of low risk timing to use maybe our less effective products that are um, at lower risk for developing resistance. Um, and then that P07, that's a low risk molecule and we can apply it seven times. I call that playing the green card. So we're just gonna, let's just keep them green. Like maybe we can't control the seeds, but if we can keep them green, then the lodge normally, we won't lose, use le yield. So we're almost compensating for the lack of disease control by keeping them green. Sounds a little crazy. Um, this is just a summary of what the growers are actually doing. And here, no more than two apps per frac of two, three, seven, and nine, only 41% are actually um, accomplishing that. And where they tend to go off is um, three apps of seven or three to four apps of frac three and frac two. Um, okay, just wanted to let you know that I do a Cornell onion fungicide cheat sheet. This is available online. It's updated every June. Um, and we break out a relative rating per BLB halos, BLB necrotic spots, SLB, leaf dieback. Does it control downy mildew? So a lot of information there. And then, oh, I don't know. Did I get you back on schedule? Did I blow you out of schedule? I don't know. Anyway, uh, 2023 is going to be my 25th year growing onions. Depending how old I am, that could be half of my life. <laughs> All right. All right. We have time for one one question. And I'll be here all day. One good, thank you. Uh, one question. Uh, from what you see in research, is hemophilia mostly coming in as a spore landing on the tissue and infection, or is it in the soil coming up and living off the dead tissue? That you got, I mean, I'm going to be sitting in that. So, what, what we know, and I can certainly tab into Mary Ruth's group here, um, that it is overwintering on tissue. Um, we know onion residue is a fairly decent source. And so it's going to have to, the, the sporing bodies occur on the necrotic, the, the residue, and then they will spew into the air and then they will land on a necrotic, uh, an onion leaf and then go from there. Is that correct? Yes. Emily is nodding her head. Yeah, so residue management. Whew, that's a tough one. <laughs> all the leaves that blow out of those harvesters, you want to bury them all? You want to get rid of them all? I don't know. I mean, I would love to, but I don't know if in the real world that's feasible. Is and that could be sprayed, let's say, post harvest pops around the hmm. spore the, the yeah. spore body, but it's like sprayed on the info that spore before it's buried. I like how you're thinking. All of our fungicides are broken. <laughs> um, yeah, or are you just selecting for resistance at that stage? I, I, don't, I don't know. But yeah, yes, thinking outside of the box. So the other thought is as the onions are growing, they're in that small like, two, three leaf stage. Mm -hmm. You know, is, is there something at that soil um, plant interface that brings them into uh, maybe a weaker stage that growing. infect the first two leaf? something that could be contact uh, upland onions are grown on plastic mulch and i have seen some nasty stuff filling them with upland onions so it's airborne it's yeah it's gonna escape somewhere so, like there it's so airborne and it's so cyclical and it's a beast 
All right. Amazing. But I like how you're thinking and we are trying, we are trying it, in the muck growing regions. It's very tricky because there's always onions somewhere. Yep. And, and these spores travel. They really, really travel. I had a new onion grower this year and I'm like, let me collect your ice list. Cause maybe this is a virgin. Maybe this is maybe the SL, maybe your SLB hasn't met a fungicide <laughs> that it's resistant to. And we've picked up resistant isolates over there. He's like, he drives an hour to come to to, to, I do a grower meeting every Tuesday. He drives an hour to meet with us. That's how far away he is. And his SLB is resistant too. And he just started growing onions. Like this was the second season. All yeah. right. Thank you, All right. Chrissy. Well, I, hope I gave you some tools. I, hopefully you can get, you guys need some more products registered. Do you have tilt? Can you get Scala? Rover? I'll, I'll oh, okay. I hope you have good news. Cause and you have P07? Yeah. All right. That's your green card. All right. Thanks, Christy. <laughs> You're okay. So up next, we have highlights of onion research trials and the onion white rot update by Mary Ruth, who will be presenting along with data from Kevin Vanderkoy. Great, Th thanks so much, Christy. Be before you get really excited about some of the products that she mentioned, we haven't had Ravrol registered in Ontario for at least 20 years. Uh, we don't have Tebuconazole registered on onions, we never did. So we have far fewer products to use for stem philium than they have in uh, in New York State. Yeah, they but the actives aren't registered. They're they're not legal, and so it's not the decision of a company. It's it's that those actives. Tebuconazole's never been registered on onions. It's not registered for white rod in Canada. And it never has been. And there is an issue with um, PMRA and Tebuconazole. There's some uh, breakdown product that they say is present in onions that is so similar to other chemistry in onions that they can't separate it out. And so the decision was made uh, many, many years ago, decades ago, that they would not register tebuconazole on onions. So uh, we, don't, we don't have a lot of the products that, what is OSO? Yeah. Right. So we do, it's called Diplomat. We've looked at it on onion downy mildew and it has no effect, no. but we haven't looked at it on um, for stem philium. Um, yeah. So that might be one that that would be yeah. worthwhile. Uh, look, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. So we and we've we've never seen a lot of efficacy from phosphorol, but. Anyway, so just check the labels. Uh, unfortunately, some of the products that uh, Christy mentioned for uh, for onions in New York State aren't registered. Uh, when you did the question about early season infection, we have a new grad student who's going to be looking at that starting this spring. So uh, that is something that uh, that we're interested in following up on, and we are continuing to do the spore trapping also. So now I'm going to talk about some of the other uh, problems that uh, that affect uh, onions, uh, downy mildew, maggot, and uh, give a little bit review of white rot. But first, I do want to uh, thank um, Kevin Vanderkoy and Jeff Farintosh. Kevin was very instrumental in organizing the speakers for this day. Jeff has been uh, doing all the uh, tech work uh, behind um, also, uh, Dennis, uh, Tyler, and Travis, I didn't know you were chairing today, uh, for uh, their involvement in this conference as well. And uh, Matt Shepard, Sean, and I are sort of the, 
the small uh, committee that puts us on every year. It is a bit different this year from the bigger uh, location with the big trade show in the past. Um, but we've also, we also have lots of people joining us uh, online, which is, uh, is nice to be able to do. So onion downy mildew, uh, I wanted to uh, spend a little time on this. Some of the growers may have forgotten what some of the symptoms are like. Uh, we haven't seen it in the marsh for a few years. And the early symptoms are really difficult to see on onions. So cool, wet weather, it has been hotter and drier recently. Uh, it, it's a weather that's conducive to downy mildew development. If we get fog in the morning, that's perfect for downy mildew to infect and sporulate. Uh, we are using a forecasting program, Downcast, have been using it for many years. And partly because it's so hard to see in the early stages, and also because it can take a long time between infection and when you can actually see symptoms. Of all of the diseases we work with, this is the one where it's most important to apply the fungicides before you see symptoms of disease. So this is why forecasting is really so important. So we didn't see any disease, any downy mildew on the marsh in uh, 2022. Uh, but we did get some additional information for disease forecasting. And we've, we continue to do fungicide trials, even though some years we don't see any disease. One of these years we will have conditions for downy mildew and we'll able, be able to do a good comparison. But we know Ritamil has been effective for a long time. Arondis is a highly effective material that's been out for a while. And Sampro is also really an effective. Viantis is a relatively new product we're testing. Seraphil is a biological. We've looked at Prevam, which is orange oil. We've also looked at this biological T77. Diplomat, we were just talking about. The polyoxin D is um, allowed for organic use. And of course, we compare that to an untreated check. So in 2021, in our trials, disease developed really late in the season. Um, it was so late that we were only looking at lesions per plot, and we didn't have any significant differences because some of the plots had no disease at all, so they were zeros. But we did see a trend, uh, no effect with Diplomat. Here's our untreated check. And it did look like our standards, Ar Aranda, Sampro, the Viantis, the new one, and the Ritamil uh, all worked really, uh, really well. And one year we will get more disease in our trials and we'll actually be able to uh, have a good test. 2022, no disease. We still take it through and look at yield. Sometimes products increase yield or decrease yield, but there were no differences in, um, in yields either in 2022. And these were very respectable yields in that trial. So the downcast uh, is important. We did have some high risk weather in late July. Probably a number of you sprayed your onions um, when that uh, warning went out. No disease on the marsh, but not too far away from here uh, in an urban garden that didn't get sprayed, there was lots of sporulation following that uh, weather that was conducive to downy mildew. So we think that's a good um, confirmation that the downcast program is actually working. And the last couple of years, we have been including spore trapping for downy mildew as part of our uh, forecasting as well, because if there's no spores, then that means the risk of disease is that much lower. And we will continue those uh, fungicide trials, as I mentioned. Uh, now, onion maggot, again, our products are working really well these days, so I hope you're not seeing any kind of damage like that. But if we have untreated onions, we can still get lots of maggots in a bulb, and we can still see lots of damage. So we're continuing to look at new products for um, onion maggot control. Uh, the pressure varies in our trials, and it would in your fields also from year to year. Um, 2021, for, for whatever reason, we had very low onion maggot damage. Uh, last year, we considered that moderate. 
We were interested in a new product, Chimegra, that's registered on some field crops and look, looked at it, applied inferno at seeding or sprayed over the road just after seeding. And this was really interesting because it's a new mode of action. And just as with fungi, it's good to alternate modes of action to control insects as well. Uh, so we uh, compared it to the seed treatment with Suppresto. We considered that our standard, looked at inferno over the row, combined them, and also had a half rate. And all of the seed was also treated with Evergall Prime to control for smut. Uh, we mark out our plots before we see any damage and look at first generation, second generation, total damage, and then a, we have a separate yield uh, section as well. So in 2022, I mentioned moderate damage, uh, just over 20% in the check. The half rate, um, not statistically different, but the Chimegra treatments um, were um, effective, way under 5% damage, and Suppresto was also extremely effective in this trial. Unfortunately, Chimegra is not going to get registered on onions, at least not anytime soon. Uh, we did confirm, and this wasn't a surprise, that Suppresto is a very effective product for uh, protecting onions from maggot damage. Uh, but we do have another new product, Plinazolin, that we will be looking at this coming year on seed. This is, and we'll also be looking at uh, this Luma Verde, which is a new formulation of spinosad. So we've known for a long time that the act of spinosad is really good for controlling onion maggot, but this is a new formulation. And this trial, we're doing it in conjunction with New York State, California, and uh, Washington State. So exactly the same treatments in four different areas. So that's going to be really interesting. And Evergall Prime, no surprise, it was highly effective for controlling onion smut. So a bit of a review on onion white rot. We haven't done any actual research on this for probably 20 years because we don't have any new products or any new um, uh, chemistry to look at, but I'll review what we have done, what we do know. And there are a few recommendations, not nearly as much as, uh, as we'd like. So white rot is caused by a fungus. It uh, overwinters and uh, survives for 10 or 20 years in soil as uh, dark sclerotia. They only germinate when onions or related crop is grown in the field. So it's a root exudate, stimulate germination, roots are infected, they it infects the roots, grows up to the base of the onion, and it can spread along the row from onion to onion uh, through the roots as well. So in the field, uh, this was an early affected onion. You can even see the fungus growing over the soil to infect the uh, onion beside it. And uh, this is a picture. All of these tiny little black dots are the sclerotia. So there's hundreds, probably thousands on one infected uh, bulb. Those end up back in the soil and they stay there for 10 or 20 years, however long until the next onion crop or garlic crop is uh, grown in the field. And it will continue to develop in storage as well and continue to rot the bulbs. So there was a lot of interest at one time, this was about 20 years ago, the chemistry called diallyl disulfide, it was sold as Alley Up. It had to be applied with a fumigant. Um, it was registered in a number of countries, but the chemistry is no longer available. The product hasn't been available for at least 15 years. It did require application a couple of times, ideally, before you put onions back in the field. Um, it was relatively expensive. Uh, the good news is the California Garlic and Onion Research Advisory Board has been funding research on alley onion white rot for quite a long time. So there are researchers looking for alternatives to this product and also looking at, at other uh, fungicides for, um, for use against white rot. And this just, it has to be 
injected into the soil uh, and rolled to hold it in. Um, but we did do this work in the Holland Marsh and we did show that this product uh, did reduce white rot. Uh, there are a number of fungicides registered in other countries. Uh, like uh, tabuconazole um, that can be used, but none of these are registered for white rot in Canada. And uh, tabuconazole is not registered on onions at all. There's the Folicure product is registered on uh, wheat. Um, and the uh, difenaconazole, one that we heard about, uh, flutioxanil is one of the ones I think that Krista was looking at. Um, the fumigant metham sodium, uh, there has been some work in other countries on that. Um, with vapam, there's a short window after onion harvest where the soil temperatures are correct. If you don't have it within the right soil temperatures, it won't kill the sclerotia, so it's not uh, not useful. So it's it's just never really been used or tested very much for uh, for white rot control. So people have also looked at biological controls, including several fungi um, and also uh, mycorrhizal fungi. And we did do some work on this uh, in growers' fields in the marsh. Um, but we focused on onions grown from transplants and we don't have any data on seeded onions. So as you know, there's, uh, there are a number of um, commercial formulations of mycorrhizae. Uh, lots of the soilless mixes now from um, uh, like ProMix come with mycorrhizae already in them. And when we looked at mycorrhizae, uh, again, this is like 20 years ago, um, our untreated check, this is a grower's field, uh, about 22% of the onions had white rot. Um, we had two different products. So these were in the soilless mix. The onion transplants were grown in the soilless mix, planted out in the field. And this is the amount of disease at harvest. And the product uh, microvam, these, in this case, not significantly different. Microvam seemed to um, hold up better. So I'm not sure exactly what mycorrhizae formulation is in the soilless mixes that you can use right now. Um, but the exciting part was that it, this was as effective as tabuconazole. So this was 11%, 12 or 13%. The mycorrhizae did reduce disease by about 50%, but even the mycorrhizae or the fungicides, they're not a 100% solution. So if you've got 20% uh, white rot in your transplanted field or your field of onion transplants, you don't know if you would have had 40% white rot if you didn't use the mycorrhizae or if the mycorrhizae aren't working and you just have 20% disease. So without those untreated checks, it's really hard to know how effective it is. But essentially right now, that's the only thing we have to recommend uh, for managing white rot. We can forecast it, but all that tells you is that it's gonna be a bad year for, uh, for white rot. Uh, so this fungus is very sensitive to temperature and it grows best at cool temperatures. So uh, around nine is the, the minimum. In um, uh, work was, that was done in Oregon State, they applied it to the Holland Marsh and temperatures between 10 and 20 Celsius in the, just in the top five centimeters of the soil. So just at the base of the bulb where white rot would be developing are optimum for disease development. If it gets warmer than that, it actually stops growing. And when it stops growing, it doesn't reactivate immediately. It takes some time to start growing again if temperatures drop. So last year we saw some white rot in June in onions because the temperatures were in that range. Then it stopped for a while when it warmed up. And then often we see the most white rot in August as the nighttime temperatures start to drop and the average soil temperatures are uh, cooler. 
So we do put these forecasts on the agriphone. Um, so you can at least know if it's warm enough that there's no risk of white rot, or maybe there's um, uh, white rot developing. So of course, plant pathologists always say avoid fields where there's a problem. And if it, the white rot's there for 10 or 20 years, that's not gonna be easy to do, uh, not grow onions in that field. If you um, have the opportunity to grow onion transplants with mycorrhizae in the mix, that can provide some, uh, some help. But years when there's warm temperatures, we don't see any white rot or almost no white rot in the marsh at all. If it's cooler, and that's often cooler in winter, wetter, we do see white rot developing. Um, if uh, the agrophone says that there is a risk, that's when you should be scouting your fields more intensively, looking for onions that um, the tops just don't look as healthy, pull them out, look for the white mold at the base of the bulb. And at that point, all we can say is harvest early, as early as you can, uh, let the fungus dry out on the base of the bulb, use artificial curing, you're probably doing that anyway, but that heat also dries up the fungus and stops it from developing uh, further. You saw a few advertisements for our green book yesterday, all of our results from uh, this past year are written up there. If you want to go back 20 years and read about what we did for managing white rot, those uh, publications are online on the same website. Uh, I want to acknowledge funding, of course, the Bradford Co-op, Fresh Veg Growers, the California Garlic and Onion Research Advisory Board does put money into our work on onion maggot and some of the other trials and also the Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance. And Travis, do we have any time for questions? We have time for, if there's one pressing question for sure. And I'll be around for the rest of the day, of course, so. Okay. Right on, thank you, Mary Ruth. So up next, we have Alana, who will be uh, giving us a product update from Corteva, helping us grow. Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. I am your first non-technical um, data-driven presentation. So I will uh, hopefully uh, um, provide you with a little reprieve and uh, we'll jump in. There are three things I want to talk about in my 10 minutes. Um, Celebro nematicide, Utricia N, uh, efficiency biostimulant, and success in insecticide. So we're going to jump into Celebro. Um, and it is a little bit carrot based. I was told that's okay to talk about carrots today. Uh, and so bear with me here. So everything we're growing has to do with a healthy environment. Um, everything we do affects the environment and healthy soil uh, is, you know, I hope what everybody's thinking about as they are uh, growing their crops. Within our, our soils though, sometimes our soil food web gets thrown off a of balance. And, and when that happens, plant parasitic nematodes can become the dominant species. And if, if plant parasitic nematodes are the dominant species, they are harmful to the soil and plant health. Um, plant parasitic nematodes are a small fraction of the soil nematode community. We do know we've got good, good nematodes and bad nematodes. If the plant parasitic ones are present though, they can inflict significant damage. And so, um, one of the things, if you have a, a plant parasitic nematode, you need to be using a modern nematicide um, and Celebro is your solution to, to help you with plant parasitic nematodes. Celebro is compatible with biologicals and other non-target organisms. It is compatible with the, the beneficial uh, soil organisms. Celebro has a favorable environmental profile. Currently in Canada, Celebro is registered on carrots, potatoes, fruiting vegetables, and cucurbits. Soil is a living entity, we all know that. And so when you use Celebro, um, you should be aware that it is safe to use um, because it is safe on your soil microbes. It's not uh, impacting the soil rhizosphere health. 
Celebro has no fungicidal or bacterial bactericidal effects. Along with being stewards of the land, I know you folks are very concerned with your employees, your stewards of, of, of their health, their safety um, in everything you do. And so the agriculture industry has commonly used older products um, when they're dealing with plant parasitic nematodes. And, and when you look at the labels of those, those older products, you see things like this, um, danger and poison. If you're gonna use a modern nematicide like Celebro, and you look at the label, it's gonna look like that. There are no poison, there's no danger symbols on Celebro. And so as we go forward, as we farm for the future, please consider Celebro nematicide. Um, it is effective. Um, it's gonna give you a, an environmentally responsible option for managing your nematodes. Um, it will also help to improve the quality of your crops when plant parasitic nematodes are present. This is uh, two pictures from the Maritimes. Uh, the picture on the left just shows you uh, untreated versus treated. And if you look at the treated side, you do have uh, larger crop canopy, larger uh, plants, the root systems, which I don't show here, they are larger. And what that equates to is the picture on the right, you get more yield you get more uniform yield. Um, and it is, it is something that, as we've been trialing this, um, we're seeing positive results. A few important information pieces for 2023. As I said, Celebro is registered in Canada. We have it on carrots, potatoes, tomatoes, and cucurbits. Our situation is the EPA has delayed for a third time the registration. And so they're now telling us uh, the US will get registration in late May, early June. So as a result, uh, using Celebro in Canada this year may reduce your export opportunities. And we want you to be aware of that. We don't want to obstruct, any, uh, obstruct your crops, your marketing, or prevent you from any um, exporting opportunities. So our recommendation is that if you choose to use Celebro, you use it on crops that will be consumed in Canada this year. There is product available in Ontario, if you are interested in using this product, please speak to your retailer. Okay, second product, uh, Utricia N nitrogen efficiency biostimulant. What is Utricia N? It's a nutrient efficiency biostimulant. It is a bacteria that will fix nitrogen and um, put it into a form that the plant can use. This bacterium is Methylobacteria symbioticum. It works two ways, it's a two-step process. It enters the plant through the leaves, through the stomata specifically, um, and then colonizes the entire leaves. Once this bacteria is on the leaves, it is then pulling atmospheric nitrogen from the air and converting it into usable plant forms. Why use Utricia N? There's three reasons. It's providing supplemental nitrogen. It's increasing your crop productivity, improving quality, and it can be used on multiple crops, including carrots. Key features of Utricia N, foliar application, broad application windows. Um, it's a dry formula, so it's stable for one to two years, colonizing the entire plant, one application, and it's working throughout the entire season, low rates, and it is registered for organic crops. Key considerations with Utricia N, air temperature, air humidity, and time of day. This product enters through the stomata. So you wanna make sure you're getting uh, conditions that the stomata are open. So we're looking for air temperatures 15 to 25. We are looking for air humidity between 30 to 50% and time of day early morning when those stomata are open. Application timing, the label uh, has this table and it shows you uh, multiple crops Broccoli, onions, cauliflower, carrots, it's the top box up there. Application timing is four leaf stage um, to the beginning of branching or tillering. This is just an image from Quebec. Um, treated was on the right-hand side, untreated on the left-hand side. So again, it's providing a constant nitrogen supply, supplemental nitrogen, and it's allowing you for a more uniform crop. Also on the label, so just key considerations, standard rate, 135 grams to the acre, 10 to 25 gallons uh, of water. 
your water um, chlorine content should be less than one part per million and the pH five to eight. I applied it to some winter squash this year. Here's just uh, an image. Um, we had no, we couldn't tell from the headlands throughout the growing season that anything was happening. But uh, once we harvested, we had uh, bigger fruit, more uniform weight in our treat treated plots. Last topic, I got two minutes left for the last topic. Uh, it's, I'm gonna talk about an insecticide now. So Corteva has um, a group called spinosins, and uh, there are three insecticides within this group of spinosins, delegate, success, and entrust. These, this group uh, is originated from a soil organism, and uh, what the soil organism uh, was capable of doing was it produced these things called spinosids. And success and entrust uh, are, are consisted of a mixture of two of these 20 spinosins that the soil organism produced, um, spinosin A and D. The reason why I'm talking about success and, and these spinosins is it because th this product is registered on several crops that you folks are growing, brassicas, root vegetables, onions, labeled for a multitude of insects. I'm only putting a, a few here, uh, you know, cabbage maggots, swede midge, thrips, group five, pH, uh, this product has a pH of between six to eight, and it has a residual of seven to 10 days. I wanna focus on cabbage maggot briefly. Uh, everybody I'm sure is aware that chloropyrifos or Corteva's product Lorsban is no longer allowed, banned by PMRA. Our suggestion as a replacement is success. Uh, it is registered on brassicas for cabbage maggot, the difference is this product needs to go on at a different timing than Lorsban, different from what you're used to. Success has to go on your transplants in the greenhouse. It is a drench application. Um, again, what you were used to was the, the in furrow application. We have a tech sheet. I have it in, in, at the display table there. Come and grab it. Um, please, please start experimenting with different cabbage maggot um, option, control options in 2023. Again, as a refresher, 2023 is the last year that chlorpyrifos could be used at all. I also want to just mention Lors Ban or chlorpyrifos was also registered for onions. Um, onion maggot, I have some product available for trials this year. Um, we are looking at controlling uh, transplanted onions. So again, I'm looking at the transplants. I'm looking at doing a drench in the greenhouse with onions in 2023. If you are interested in partnering with me on some demos, come find me or talk to your retailer and they know where to reach me as well. That's all I've got. Kept us in my 10 minutes. Talk to you later. Any questions for Alana? Yes. I don't know why in Canada it's not allowed. In the US, they have it. Yeah. And it, it works really well. Yeah. We show that over and over again. Yeah. And so I am getting to be buddy buddy with my regulatory manager. And so I will keep poking her and asking that exact question why? Yeah. Okay. Oh, a question in the back. Your shelf life was said one to two years, but in the Close, close package two, open package one. So it's a, a living organism. So as long as it's being stored in conditions that you're comfortable with, it's not freezing, it's not baking, um, you will get two years out of it. Right on. Thank you, Elena. Our next presentation is online. It's Agrobotics, Innovations in Weed Management. Uh, done by Kristen O'B, Chuck Barish, and Graham Algie. Okay, excellent. Thanks, everybody. Um, I'm really happy I could actually provide this presentation um, over Zoom. Thanks for everyone accommodating me. Okay, so today I'm going to talk about uh, agrobotics, innovations, and in weed management. And um, I would like to acknowledge that this is a big team effort. It's part of all the work that has been accomplished so far to date as part of the agrobotics working group. Um, and so lots of help here from the Ontario Crops Research Station up here in Bradford, from everybody, 
everybody, Tyler, Kevin, Jeff, Mary Ruth, and we have some exciting work that will be happening here again this summer. Okay, so my presentation today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the background, the Agrobotics Working Group, how it got started, who, who it, who's all involved, and what, um, what we've accomplished to date and what we're planning to do in the future. I'm going to talk about the robotic leaders that have been trialed uh, last summer, the farm droid, the Nile Dino, the Nexus La Chaver, and talk about, just give some brief conclusions about what we learned last year. In the future, work in vegetables, strawberries, grapes, and trellis fruit, as well as apples, just so you can see the scope of all the work happening in the agrobotic space. So in terms of the background, the story, how did this all get started? Well, basically one phone call started it all in the spring of 2021. Um, I had a call from um, Chuck Bersich and Grant Elgy from uh, Hagerty Creek. I didn't know them from Adam <laughs> um, because uh, Chuck is a large uh, field crop grower, about 3000 acres he farms with his brother as well as an agri-service provider. And he, he was planning on uh, purchasing two small Neoaz robots from France. And he wanted to set up some de demonstrations and field vegetables to try them out and see if they actually did what they said they were going to do. And so I said, yes, absolutely. Um, because, you know, with respect to, so we identified this as an opportunity. And so I thought, wow, this is, this is really excellent. Let's get a group of stakeholders together and, um, called around and asked if people wanted to start participating in some of this new robotic technology that uh, Hagerty Creek was bringing to Ontario. And so basically it started out as a small group of, you know, members from different um, uh, grower associations, and then it's actually grown significantly. And really what we want to do with this agrobotics working group is to build cross-functional teams to minimize duplication of effort and build efficiencies to influence the rate of robotics and automation adoption in Ontario. Okay, so who's all involved? Well, we're well over 100 participants. We actually meet weekly every Friday at 9 a.m. over Zoom. And we usually have a full agenda. We have people come and give presentations from different technology companies or about different funding programs. And then just based on the participation, we usually are able to bring people together to do projects in this space to bring some of those technologies into the various production systems within Ontario. So you can see uh, really it started out in 2021 as Ontario only, but now we have representative, representation from across Canada. Um, we have representation from all levels of government. We have multiple producer organizations. We have the industry and the robotics companies. We have farmer producers as well as um, representatives from the different um, grower associations. We have agribusinesses, academia, colleges and university universities, as well as funding organizations. So it's a really good, great group. And you know, of those 100, over 100 people, we have between 40 and 50 people participate every week. So what are the successes of the working group been to date? Well, in 2021, we did those demonstrations with the small NAOAS robots. And then in November, uh, the NAO Dino came and we played around with it a little bit in the fall. Um, but in 2022, we did a lot of different projects and demonstrations. Maybe you were at the one in the Hall of Marsh at the beginning of July last year. But we were really looking at four different robots in various crops and locations performing seeding, weeding, mowing, and soil sampling and analysis. The agrobotics field tour was a big highlight. So in total in 2022, uh, just over $1 million was raised through the working group to support seven projects. And so far now for 2023 to 2028, um, uh, about $5 million of funding has been requested and just recently secured close to 2 million for different work. And some of this money funding is coming from the Canadian Agriculture Autom Automation Intelligence Network, BioEnterprise, from the Fresh Vegetable Growers and the Uni University of Guelph and Mafra Agri Alliance program. But the needs and the membership of the working group continue to grow. 
there's a lot of activity in this space and you know uh, there's just a lot lot happening so i'm just going to focus really today on the work on robotic leaders um, so there are several different leading robots out there and they promise to reduce soil compaction reduce inputs provide a lower carbon footprint and de decrease labor requirements to test these claims, three of the autonomous weeding robot robots were trialed and compared to conventional vegetable growing practices in Ontario. The FarmDroid FD20, the Neodino, and the Nexus La Chavera, or the GOAT. I'm going to call it the GOAT. Okay, so the FarmDroid. The FarmDroid is a really unique uh, weeding robot because it has solved a logistical issue with respect to charging of charging or energy use for the, because it's all solar powered. So you don't have to worry about taking the robot out of the field to charge the batteries or anything like that. And also it's a cedar and an inter and inter row weeder. Um, so it actually geo-references every seed and can weed around in between the rows. So it's very, very cool. And so we tested this one out in sugar beets and rutabagas last season. The, the reason we chose sugar beets is because it was originally developed for the organic sugar beet industry in Denmark. And we decided that, um, you know, we should really trial it out and what it was built for first to make sure it works and to figure out all the kinks and how it works within our production system. So it actually seeded uh, the sugar beets at a lower density than a conventionally treated field. And what ended up happening, we had more sugar beets with more consistent size and shape and higher sugar content. Um, the producer commented that although the farm droid took longer to seed, it minimized the seeding date risk and pre the precision seeding benefited the crop as it resulted in much more consistent germination. There were some challenges, however, it was a very wet spring, um, so it was hard to, it took a very long time to seed the field and it really couldn't heavy handle trash. There was a lot of uh, corn stubble in the field. So that was a bit of a bit of an issue as well. Here you can see um, in this, in this uh, aerial image, in the middle here, this is the sugar beet field. In the middle here was where the farm droid planted and on the edges is where the conventional, uh, conventional planting occurred. Here is a short video. You can see, uh, yes, it does go very slow, <laughs> a little bit like watching uh, paint dry, but it does do a really good job. Both growers that used uh, the farm droid were pre pretty pleased with its performance. So here's uh, the rutabagas. Basically here you can see the farm droid and the conventional plot, very consistent. Um, the only difference with this one is the the producer did not want to reduce um, the amount of the seeding rate per acre in the rutabagas. So the farm droid only did the uh, weeding in between the rows and didn't uh, reduce the, uh, the planting density. But the, the grower commented that, you know, next year they would use it and would reduce the seeding, seeding density because they were very uh, comfortable with the performance and had very good yields. Uh, the Neodino, um, some of you probably saw this one working in the marsh last year. It worked really reliably, but, um, you know, it's just basically a, a, a passive weeder. It's just like a cultivator. It did the job it was supposed to do, and there was minimal issues with that. Here you can see a, a, a video of it working within the field. Okay, and the next one, uh, the next is the goat. Um, now we call this one an active weeder. This one actually is a hybrid model. So it has both a, a battery as well as a diesel fuel. Um, it has machine vision for inter and inter row mechanical weed removal. Um, it actually pulls the weeds out. So it's not cultivating the crop. Um, so this one was a more of a prototype. And, you know, there was quite a few issues with it, but there was actually two in the province last year, one in Grand Bend and one at the Muck Crops Research Station. Um, so there was uh, quite a bit of challenges, but, you know, this was uh, growing pains and a lot of information was passed along the company for improvement. 
it was removed after six weeks of operation because the onions became too large um, for the robot to continue working within the crop without damaging it. So here you can see uh, there's three arms and what it does is it identifies the weeds and then pulls out, it, it, no, it identifies the crop and it pulls out everything that's not the crop. It is pretty aggressive. Um, so you can see how there's potential for damage of the crop, which, you know, is a little bit concerning because of all the disease potential issues. If you, you have damaged the crops, it just opens them up to other, other issues. So what did we learn from some of this work last year? Well, a lot, large part of the pilot study was really spent learning how to operate the robots, but the data has been really insightful for our trials for this season. We found out obviously that conducting trials on commercial operations with high value crops is a bit challenging. You know, the producer's production needs to come first. Um, if the robot is not performing, then we have to let the grower spray if they need to spray or whatnot. Um, there's still a curve to adoption. Um, producers, growers really need to see these technologies in their production systems and see them working and get the comfort le level with them. So for future work, we really do need to have designated test plots like areas of land where these um, different technologies can be trialed. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of uh, different ways we need to take the data when we're using these robots. So you can't really do really small plot field uh, research with uh, robotic leaders. So, but we're gonna continue to work together with collaborators and innovative growers to help de-risk these technologies to hopefully uh, enable producers to use them with confidence in the future. So uh, what about future work? Well, some pretty exciting news um, that um, uh, a project was just funded through the U of Geo Macro Agro Alliance program. You probably already have seen the Oreo. It's already there at the at the research station. Um, and so this this um, project is going to be looking at both the Oreo, the Neo Oreo, as well as the Farm Droid for for seeding and weeding onions and beets, as well as carrots. As well as this project includes. Um, real-time leaf tissue testing with uh, Picket Systems light sensor. Um, so we're pretty excited about that, this project getting funded. Um, so we'll be, I think the farm droid has also been, um, will be on a grower field this year, seeding onions, seeding and weeding onions in a grower field. So that, that will be really great. And hopefully some of you can get out and see them working this season. Also, just for your interest, I know we don't grow, grow grapes. I know there is one vineyard close by, but um, this uh, Neo Ted robot will be in Niagara this year. Um, and we'll be looking at it uh, for uh, to, to mow as well as do hilling and dehilling, and hopefully also integrate a UVC um, technology into the, the robot. Um, so this will be at Cave Springs Winery. Um, we'll also be touring uh, some work in uh, grapes and tender fruit in that area this summer. Here you can see it working. This is a video that Jeff actually took at the FIRA show. You can see how it straddles the vines. And it can actually, this is one of the few robots that does multiple tasks. It, it heals, it de-heals, it cultivates. It vine, does vine hedging as well as yield estimation. And actually, I think quite a few are working already in uh, France and Germany. And I'm um, actually, those vineyards are using those robots as a tourist attraction. So this is one that we've heard a lot of growers are really interested in. And they, they actually came through the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Convention this past year. Um, carbon Robotics, uh, Carbon Robotics Laser Weeder, uh, the model of the is being sold right now is called the Slayer. Um, so it has 30 times uh, 150 watt lasers. It basically works by electrocuting the weeds. It is not autonomous. It needs to be pulled by a tractor. Um, last year they um, had five, I think five or, or a few more working in those US states, Washington, Oregon, California, Arizona, and New Mexico. And they're planning to deliver in 2023 some to those states that are listed. Uh, there is supposedly one that should be here already in the southwestern Ontario. 
Um, I can show a short video provided by the company showing um, it taking clover out of carrots. You can see the lasers working. They have at um, Brett Goodwin from Carbon Robotics has said that they're going to bring one of their demo units up to Ontario this year. And so we're keeping in communication with them in hopes that we do have one that we can um, try out this summer. I'm not sure where that's at, but um, hopefully, hopefully they fulfill their promise and we do get to see one in Ontario this year. Now their demo units, I believe are autonomous, but the ones they're actually selling are um, need to be pulled by a tractor. There you can see the carrots and the clover and the lasers taking them. Now I will say these are quite costly. I think they're approximately 1.4 million US for one unit. And they do have a five-year commitment for technology fees of around $50,000 US per year. So it's a pretty significant cost for these um, machines. Also, uh, next is the GOAT. We are going to um, try this one out again uh, this year in um, leaf lettuce. They, they were, they've been pretty successful in leaf lettuce in Arizona over the winter. Um, so we're going to try and do some evaluations in leaf lettuce and baby spinach and see how it works out. So there's also some future work we're looking into in uh, strawberries, for example, using those Nail Oz robots to um, cut stolons, as well as you can see in the background, you can see the Karechi uh, Romeo. It's an autonomous robot that's pulling an electric mower using that for renovation and strawberries as well. Other work is, um, you know, we're looking at different harvesting technologies. You can see here this autonomous sprayer for orchards. Some trials will be conducted by our colleague there, Jason DeVoe in Omafra, comparing in this autonomous sprayer um, to uh, conventional methods this year. And that will be in around Niagara as well. And then you can see here this UVC technology for disease and insect management. UVC um, is, you know, can um, help with powdery and downy mildew as well as some small insects like mites and aphids, we think. So we want to trial that. And you can see how this uh, UVC right here is a design. We're hoping to put something like that similarly in the TED because the TED, the Nail TED robot does straddle. Um, the trellis uh, vines. So we're gonna see if that will work. And there's lots of other stuff going on as well. So there is also a drone subcommittee of people working with PMRA to figure out how to set up trials and what data to collect for drone spraying. Uh, some fungicide trials happened this past year with Bayer and Jason DeVoe and um, actually Hagerty Creek um, for tar spot control, I believe. So with that, um, I think that Jeff is going to show you a cool video that he put together of technologies from the FIRA show a little bit later today. But I would like to um, acknowledge and greatly tell everybody how much great support we've been given from everyone on the Ag Robotics Working Group. Producers, um, Mark Sorokas, Carrot King, Extra Produce, and Mark Richards, um, OMAF for staff, many of you, all, many others have been involved as well. Ontario Crops Research Station, of course, so Mary Ruth, Kevin, Sean, Jeff, and Tyler, and industry collaborators, um, the RH Accelerator, the Western Fair Association, Environmental Research and Innovation Center, and sponsors at Tech Alliance, OMAFRA, and BioTalent. So you can see um, a lot is involved in all of this work, but it is um, very fun and exciting and cool, um, and um, there's just lots of happening. And if you have any interest at all, I encourage you to participate in our working group and uh, find out what's going on. So with that, I thank you. And I hope I, uh, I just wanna give you some contacts here and sh show you. Grant is there, he's, he's there too. Um, Grant really is the one who, who uh, knows the most about all of the different robots and how to use them. So if you have questions, he's gonna be there for a little while. Um, there you go. So we hope to see you this year um, out at some of the demonstrations. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kristen.
Uh, Grant's here. If anyone has any questions, I'm sure he can uh, answer them. Well, Grant, you'll be hanging around all lunch, right? Yep. Awesome. So thank you to the morning speakers and uh, let's break for lunch. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having me today. My name is Josh Mosey and as Matt was saying, and um, I said I would stop doing this, but I'm the new Jim Chappett. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm the, the provincial amount of use coordinator with OMAF for now, uh, just over two years as of a couple of weeks ago. So um, I'm just going to give you guys a somewhat brief minor use program update and uh, I'll take questions at the end of some time. So I uh, just want to talk about the minor use here and review quickly. Uh, emergency use registrations, the priority setting workshop, which completed a couple of weeks ago. Uh, just touch briefly on chlorothalonil. There's not too much to talk about there right now, but um, I've had a couple of questions come in the last couple of weeks still. Uh, brief update on tank mixing and then talk about just what some of the ongoing minor use themes are. So in total, we did have about 137 minor use registrations put through last year, which was a good year. Uh, significantly up from 2021, largely due to a couple big minor use label expansions for um, some of the mineral oil products and uh, uh, acetic acid bioherbicides, but also due to the RIP period that happened with the federal election a couple of years ago. So um, uh, a good year overall with a number of new registrations coming through. Uh, of those, uh, at least 70% of those did support Ontario growers and that uh, uh, there will be some good benefits that come out of those registrations. Notable ones did include Bellum Prime on garlic, uh, Exero for bald vegetables and Allium leaf miner. Uh, that's the first for this pest, which is not yet here, but uh, it's good to have something in a toolbox ready to go if and when it is found, as well as uh, Prowl H2O for both transplant and direct seeded onions. With respect to active minor use projects, there is about 550 in the stream right now under review with PMRA and uh, approximately 29 to 30% of those do support uh, field vegetable uses. So there's a fair bit coming down the pipeline right now. Um, aside from that, there, there's a further breakdown of some of the other crops that are also going on. And uh, at least 20% of those are joint RFR projects right now. So we're working with our American counterparts to uh, do joint reviews and get some product uses done for both Canadian and American growers. With respect to some of the field uh, vegetable registrations that came through in the last year, uh, we did have quite a few ranging from um, some of the, the herbicides, uh, insecticides, as well as fungicides. Um, I could read all these, but I'm, I'm just probably going to stick with just the, the product names. So Abamectin, uh, Serene, we did see Ultra Blazer, which I know was popular for some of the carrot fellas last year. Uh, Belief came through, Frontier Max, Decree, um, Exero, Fontellus, Flumioxin, Chateau. Uh, we did see some of the Oxidate products come through, Ritamel Gold, Suffoil X, uh, Confine Extra. Uh, partner recently came through just the other day for um, leeks, dry bulb onions, green onions, and dry bulb shallots, um, as well as Prowl H2O, a couple of the Clethodim products, as well as Oberon for uh, some of the bulb vegetables. With respect to emergency uses, we did face another high demand year uh, with over 10 emergency use registrations. This has been the highest number in well over a decade. Uh, my predecessor used to say four emergency uses was a big year for Ontario and we're more or less doubling that and, and then some, but uh, we're hoping to get that lumber down just a little bit this year, but I am still expecting at least seven for the 23 field season. Uh, there is captain in place already for field peppers and anthracnose. Um, we're jumping on board with the or organic clove um, oil sprout inhibitor product on uh, potatoes, which is called Deco. Uh, Delta Guard will continue on boxwood plants, uh, fullback, for use on hops for diaporthy leaf blight. That's a new um, fungal pathogen. We will continue a switch on the brassica crops for Altenaria, uh, Nialta on greenhouse strawberries, and Palladium as well for greenhouse strawberries. Um, I did hear some really good things about Tough last year. Uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending which way you look at it, we weren't able to go through with that again this year because Irrational didn't exist given that Lorox returned the market for this year. Um, Rest assured though, we do have a project in for this coming up in the next couple of years, and we will see that product use hopefully return for use on carrots in the next couple of years, once it makes its way through the PMC and uh, PMRA uh, evaluation process. 
So with respect to the priority setting workshop, we did wrap that up a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they took place back in person again this year in Gatineau, Quebec, which is the first time since pre-COVID. Uh, we covered entomology on uh, March 21st, pathology the second day, and weeds took place on the Thursday. Uh, in total, we did raise 29 projects to an A. Uh, five of these are automatic projects with the regional upgrades, uh, three organic projects, and 21 mainstream projects between entomology, pathology, and weeds. Um, this list will be narrowed down to about 18 final projects in a couple of weeks. Um, and this is going to be due to the new capacity analysis process that PMC has introduced. So they're going to be looking at what projects made it through, what their current number of projects per crop discipline are right now, and then look at what the spread amongst the different um, uh, disciplines were and what their staffing levels are in order to narrow these down to a set number of projects. Uh, come September, we will see joint R4 projects picked up again as well. So anything that's dropped through this capacity selection process, but also makes it as an IR4 project, will automatically be picked back up as a joint project come September. Um, oh, there's, there was a few garlic priorities, but that's actually uh, made it on from a past presentation. But uh, uh, there was several field vegetable priorities that made it onto the list this year as A's, uh, notably uh, rutabaga with cabbage maggot made it on as a regional priority from Quebec. Uh, we did also see um, uh, the labeled weeds priority with prowl make it on with field peppers, uh, as well as grassy weeds on sweet potato. With respect to entomology and pathology, uh, there was another flea beetle project elevated on rutabagas again. Um, we also saw a, a uh, carrot or cost per project elevated with a proposed solution of captan. So we're hopeful to see these go through as final projects, um, but we will know more in a couple of weeks now, which time I will be in touch to uh, send some emails out to let everyone know what goes through as a final project. So hopeful that all these, or at least some of these make these through with uh, the field veg priorities, but uh, we'll be keeping an eye on these and hopeful to uh, pick these up through the joint process if anything doesn't make it through this round. With respect to chlorothalonil, I just wanted to touch briefly on this. We still don't have any updates on this yet. Um, some of you may recall that PMRA did propose cancellation of all field and uh, food uses back in February of last year. Um, there was significant consultation that went on with this with respect to feedback to PMRA. And uh, at this point, we don't have any updates, which is actually probably a good thing. Um, we kind of expect what's happening is they are updating the risk models as we speak right now. And uh, given that a lot of the cancellations were triggered by very conservative modeling estimates, we're hoping that some of the data resubmitted through the consultation period will kind of allow them to re kind of recalibrate those models and hopefully save some of these field uses. But uh, once we do have a final uh, decision on that, I will be in touch with uh, kind of the wider uh, stakeholder group here to keep you guys all in the loop. So uh, tank mixing. This was a another kind of... Uh, spur of the moment and popular subject the last couple of months. Uh, back on December 22nd, PMRA did release a uh, tank mix labeling policy. And in early February, OFEGA um, flagged this with us um, as a significant kind of decision that came out that we didn't necessarily know about right off the hop. Uh, it was quietly released, but the concerns more or less were what the implications are for growers and users of pest control products with respect to an implementation timeline. Um, the, there was kind of mixed messaging with how they would be affected, whether or not there's going to be a phase in period for them, uh, or whether or not they're expected to um, comply with the new regulations as they were released. So um, we worked together with PMRA and uh, raised these concerns uh, shortly after the OFEGA meeting. And uh, PMRA did make some commitments to uh, investigate this and make sure that growers were covered. And back on March 16th, they did update section eight of the tank mixing document to ensure that growers, extension providers, and um, obviously registrants are all included with this phase in period to make sure that nobody's kind of left out here and that we can continue to uh, use these tank mixes as, as, as usual. So uh, the take home message is that you continue doing what you've been doing previously for the 2023 and 24 seasons. Um, by winter 24, when you're starting to think about ordering those products for the next year, do you make sure that you check these labels to uh, ensure that the um, products are compatible with each other for tank mixing going forward, though? Uh, when I've been speaking with most registrants, the good news is that most are choosing to use a generic tank mixing statement. 
um, which allows basically mixing with other products as long as they also either say you can mix with product B or also use the generic tank mixing uh, statement. Um, if products do not have any updates whatsoever, uh, then that means they're considered to be silent and don't or won't be permitted for tank mixing. So there's a good cheat sheet at the end of this appendix document or in the appendix of this document. And it kind of goes through what the different scenarios might be for tank mixing. Um, so keep an eye on that. Um, it, it's a good yes or no kind of uh, tool for you to go through and see what the different options are. Um, we do expect most products uh, will continue to use that generic statement though, and that this hopefully will be a non-issue going forward. Uh, just with respect to some of the other current and ongoing minor use issues, uh, you know, the impact of reevaluation decisions continues to be a big topic and impacting what uh, priority sectors we're working on with this program. Uh, project capacity challenges over at, at the Pest Management Center. Uh, the impact of invasive species, especially spotted lanternfly, again, not here yet, but uh, causing uh, quite a bit of stir with planning and whatnot. There's resistance management issues, especially with some of the um, herbicide group products and single sites, as we heard with stemphilium even. Um, lack of effective solutions for difficult to control pests, such as root maggots, wireworms, uh, downy mildews, and, and some of the others. There's the cost of new products and product development, as well as uh, policy development for the vertical farming industry, which currently doesn't have any registered products. So we're working with PMRA right now to get kind of a, uh, a list made up to hopefully translate over from the greenhouse industry. But uh, for now, we're, we're, we're continuing to work with PMA to get these policies put in place. So last uh, was just a bit of a plug. Again, this is a, an old gym slide that he used to use quite a bit, but uh, I think it's a good take home. And uh, what you guys can do to help me out here and, and my colleagues nationally with the minor use program to get more products is, please do participate with some of these annual minor use meetings that we have each fall when we're setting these priorities, or at least reach out to me if there is some big issues you want uh, tackled with uh, the priority sheets. Uh, encourage re uh, your colleagues to, uh, to participate in these as well. Uh, ensure your provincial organizations are also represented at the national minor use meetings. So typically I'm able to bring a small delegation of Ontario participants there. So uh, if this is something you'd be interested in participating as an industry rep, a grower rep, or a representative of your commodity, please do reach out to me. I can try and get you on a list for future workshops. And uh, if and when requested, either from um, myself or crop specialists or uh, OFBGA, um, please do try and provide that up-to-date information for how you're using products, especially when we're working on revaluation situations, emergency uses, or pesticide use surveys. Often this information is very useful for us to uh, try and maintain registrations going forward and um, ensuring we can continue to have a, a full toolbox. So my contact information is here. If you have any questions, let me know. Um, I'd be happy to answer them. Otherwise, feel free to reach out at any time. Thanks. Is there any questions for Josh, Mary Ruth? We can, as long as continue to be labeled, we can continue to go forward with that. Um, there's there's no cancellations as of right now. So with it being just a proposed decision, there's no changes to the product label until we get that final document. So from a regulatory standpoint, you can tank it. So obviously that's not going to be the case here. So this two years is to give the manufacturers of these products time to update their labeling. Exactly. So the, the tank mixing policy is a complete reversal from the, there's a 2009 document that was put out by PMRA and, um, Essentially, the PMRA is now mandating that registrants must have their labels updated to permit tank mixing uh, as per the label. So the three options, uh, as we were talking about, was um, using that generic tank mix label statement. And if the two products do use that, then you're good to go. It's business as usual. Uh, there's a select few products where the registrants are updating it to have a restricted statement, which says you can tank mix with products or you can tank mix product A with products B, C, and D. Uh, we're not seeing that quite as common, uh, but it is an option or they can be silent or choose not to allow tank mixing. But um, essentially, as you, you mentioned, it's a two-year phasing period for registrants to get accelerated registration paperwork put into the PMRA. And uh, the PMRA is going to be racing through to update these and make sure these are all reflected on the, uh, the labels themselves. Uh, 
So there was, there's been back and forth to our knowledge right now. They're not affected. They've talked about fertilizers a little bit in this policy itself, but they're not regulated by the pest control products act. Uh, so we've been kind of going back and forth on that, but, uh, it, it, the general consensus right now is that it's only for pest control products themselves and those regulated by the PCPA. So I have to be careful with my choice of, of words, but um, this has been brought on by some litigation issues and uh, PMRA feels that this is a way to ensure they're covered with um, how pest control products are used given the labels, the law. So um it's uh, certainly adding some added work to the organization right now, but um, they felt it was necessary to update that paperwork. So we uh, kind of have to go through the motions to comply at this point. So Josh, does that include seed treatments as well? Yes. Yeah. So Sopresto and Evergall would not be, wouldn't be something you could do on your onion seed. It'll have to, they'll also have to be updated to uh, reflect those label statements. Oh, uh, that one I'll get back to you on. I'm not going to speculate, but uh, if it's coming and treated, I, I'm assuming the, the seed dealers will have to comply with that, given that they're still using those products themselves. Um, but I'll maybe reach out back to you guys with an answer to get out later. Thanks, Josh, Thank very you. much. I would encourage any, any growers who do want to go to the minor use meetings and see the slow grinding process of how Josh spends his days. It, it is worth it. Yeah. Okay, so second, we have uh, Tyler from the research station here uh, with an IPM update. So today I did just want to give a bit of an IPM update um, and uh, our results from the 2022 season. To start off, um, our objectives for the IPM program, first off, are to scout your fields. Um, we also do disease and insect forecasting, um, identify diagnose diseases, insects, and weeds that, uh, that we find in the Hall Marsh here. Um, we want to provide you growers with timely, accurate, and convenient access uh, to this insect and disease information. This is mainly done through those IPM updates. Um, and we're always looking to improve and update our program. So um, I always welcome feedback if you have any. So in terms of these, uh, these, these agrophone updates or IPM updates, um, these include weather information from the past few days, so temperature and precipitation, um, also our insect and disease pressure around the marsh, disease forecasting information, so are we at a high or low risk for any of these diseases, um, control recommendations and those registered products um, for certain diseases or insects that we're dealing with at, at, the, at the time, um, any new products that do come uh, into registration, and um, any upcoming events that we have as well. So before I go any further, I just want to uh, thank all of our funding partners, uh, everyone who contributes to the IPM program and helps keep the IPM program going. Um, this includes the Bradford Co-op, all of our chemical company sponsors, all of you growers who participate in the program and the Ontario Agri-Food Innovation Alliance. All right, now we'll jump into 2022 just a little bit. Um, so a little bit of a weather summary. Um, so if we're looking at uh, 2022 rain and temperature here, um, in terms of temperature, for the most part, um, our temperatures were, were pretty consistent and relative to the 10 year average. Um, May was a little bit warmer um, at 15 degrees Celsius. And you can see that July was, uh, was a little bit of a cooler month as well. And we look at rainfall, um, again, somewhat, uh, somewhat relative for some of the months to the, our 10-year average, but we did have a drier May and September. And then we also run a diagnostic clinic out of our, uh, through our IPM program and out of the research station here. Um, so last year, we had 70 samples submitted. 73% um, of these were diseases. Um, so these are submitted by growers, um, some of our scouts as well. Um, so this helps us confirm um, diseases like stem phyllium, downy mildew, things that are happening in the field. Um, and 6% of these samples were uh, from insect damage. So a little bit lower than previous years. And this diagnostic lab, it's available to everyone. So if you have a sample you'd like to bring in, feel free. 
and we will get back to you with uh, our results as soon as possible. And just in terms of grower participation over the, the past decade, um, you can see a little bit of a fluctuation, uh, but uh, over the past few years, uh, we've been relatively consistent, which has been nice. All right, so I know this is uh, onion day, but we're, we're gonna touch on carrots uh, through the IPM uh, uh, update here and a little bit on celery later. Um, so in terms of carrots, uh, cavity spot and forking were probably the most common um, disease issues that we found in carrots this past season. Uh, forking can be contributed by pythium or uh, nematodes as well. Um, and we also had a little bit of fusarium uh, root rot in, uh, in our, our, our harvest carrot samples. So just to visualize this a little bit more, uh, you can see that we did find cavity spot and forking in all of the fields that we sampled at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the season. Um, incidence was uh, moderate to low though for both cavity spot and forking and severity, severity of these two diseases was quite low as well. Um, you can also see a kind of a similar trend for a fusarium dry rot here. Um, fusarium was found in most of the fields. Incidence was low and severity for the most part was definitely low as well. All right, now just to touch on carrot insects. So of all the insects that we generally look for, um, aster leaf hoppers were definitely the most common we found from field to field. Um, we did find some carrot weevils and carrot rust flies um, and a little bit of cutworm damage, but we did not find any flea beetle, wireworm or millipede damage this year. And just as I present some of these results, um, there's a lot of lines and, and a lot of these lines represent fields from certain areas. So we got the North, East, Central, South and West and they're all of the same color. So hopefully they can, uh, you, you can keep track here. So in terms of carrot weevil, um, for the most part, our carrot weevil, our cumulative carrot weevil numbers were quite low compared to other years. And um, we did have a little bit of, of, of a higher cumulative weevil counts um, in the northern region, over our, our five weevils per trap threshold. And it's nice, though, to look at um, the average number of weevils from all of these fields um, over uh, a select few years here. So 2015, 2016, some higher weevil damage years. Um, but when we compare this to 2021 and 2022, um, you can see that there's this nice decline in the number of weevils that we're starting to capture. Um, so this is likely an indication of uh, the registration and adoption of uh, our insecticides, Rymon and XRL. And um, based on those uh, cumulative weevil populations and counts that we saw there um, at harvest, our damage for uh, due to weevils uh, in our carrots were very low, uh, zero in most regions and just 0 0.2 in the north. So quite low damage for carrot weevils this past year. And a pretty similar trend can be seen for carrot rust fly as well. Um, fairly low population, uh, fairly low counts throughout the season. Um, we did see a little bit of a spike there in uh, kind of the mid-August. And this correlated to very low damage once again. Uh, most of the regions, we did not see uh, any da damage on average. Um, and just a little bit of damage, 0.3% in the central region. And just to visualize uh, one more thing here. So we have weevils counts, uh, sorry, damage, um, average damage here that we found from, from our fields each year. So we have weevils and rust flies um, side by side. And 2016, you can see that really high weevil damage. Um, but then you, when you start to look at 2019 to, uh, to now, um, the registration adoption and proper use of Rymon and XRL have really helped decrease the amount of weevil damage that we've been finding at harvest. Um, pretty similar to, to four carat rust fly, you could say. Uh, we did have a bit of a blip there in 2019, but for the most part, it has been, um, we have seen quite low damage due to rust fly as well. Leaf hoppers, on the other hand, um, we found some quite, quite some high numbers of aster leaf hoppers uh, this past season. Um, so most fields did, um, surpass the 20 leaf hoppers per trap threshold at some point. Um, we did see aster yellow's damage um, in our fields um, and aster yellow symptoms, um, but uh, the symptoms and damage were a little bit lower than they were in 2021. 
and 2021 was a very high uh, aster yellow season. So just in summary for carrots, um, cavity spot damage was similar to previous years. Uh, leaf blights, I didn't uh, touch on those at all, but uh, they were low overall. Um, we had really low weevil and rust fly damage and after aster leaf hopper counts were high, um, but uh, aster yellows was a little bit lower than, than in 2021. All right, now on to onions. So the main diseases in onions we were, uh, we were finding this year were stem phyllium and pink root. Um, and as Mary Ruth mentioned, uh, a little bit more white rot this year as well. Um, we did not find any botrytis or downy mildew though this past year. And just to visualize this a little bit again, um, you can see that we did find pink root and stem phyllium in all of our uh, scouted onion fields. Um, incidence was a little bit high, but severity was uh, fairly low. Stem phyllium, stem phyllium was, was uh, you could say, low to moderate, kind of depending on your cultivars or varieties. Um, and we did have a little bit more white rot this past year as well. So just to focus on stem phyllium just a little bit more here, um, we really didn't see stem phyllium taking off until kind of mid-August. And I just wanted to kind of touch on our uh, possible stem phyllium management uh, with the fungicides that we currently have. Um, so if you can have your seed treated with Evergold Prime, um, Penflufen, it should provide some early season protection. And then after that, your first spray could be uh, a Mancazeb, uh, especially if your seed is treated with Evergold Prime. And then your second and future sprays, um, it could follow this order. Maravis Duo, we found uh, fairly good success with Maravis Duo, as you saw earlier this morning. Um, and then we have Circadus and then possibly a Provia, Provia Top or Maravon there too. Um, and we would, uh, we would possibly recommend uh, tank mixing Mancazeb with one of these Group 7 uh, sprays. Um, it could be beneficial for a little bit of uh, resistance, um, prevent resistance development. And just to visualize this a little bit again, so we had this on our, our IPM report last year. Um, so the Evergold Prime should provide a little bit of uh, early season protection here. And then if possibly we, st we start catching uh, some spores or canidia kind of near the end of June there. So you could possibly apply that Mancazeb uh, spray near the end of the month uh, after we're catching those uh, those canidia in our spore traps and kind of looking ahead and possibly seeing some few high risk days that might come about. So those uh, those contact fungicides, Mancazeb, uh, should give you around 10 days of protection depending on um, your conditions, uh, the weather conditions. Um, and then you can follow that up with a uh, your first systemic Maravis Duo. Um, so those systemic should provide you around 10 days uh, protection. And then follow that up with Circadus, possibly tank mix it with Mancazeb. And then after that, follow up with uh, Provia, Provia Top or Maravon. All right, just to touch on uh, onion insects, onion mega flies and thrips. Um, so our onion mega flies, our degree day model did predict uh, first uh, adult emergence around May 15th. And uh, we started trapping the adults on May 19th. So good indication that our degree day model is working quite well, uh, so that's good. And onion mega fly populations were quite low throughout the season. Very similar um, trend with, was seen with thrips as well. It was a little bit of a warmer and drier kind of start to the season. So we did see them starting a little bit earlier, um, but overall the populations uh, were quite low, counts were quite low. Um, and keep in mind too, our spray threshold for thrips is three thrips per leaf. So in summary for onions, um, stem phyllium leaf blight was present in all of our fields. Uh, severity was, was a little bit lower than the past few years. Pink root was also present, but severity again was low. Um, as Mary Ruth mentioned, white rot was a little bit uh, more prevalent this year and onion maggot and thrips damage was low as well. So just to quickly go through celery, um, celery diseases, all of them were fairly low. Uh, your celery leaf blights were low, leaf curl, um, and our aster yellows was also quite low, considering we were catching uh, quite a few aster leaf hoppers in, in our fields. And in terms of insects, um, again, yeah, our, our aster leaf hoppers, we were, we were catching them quite readily. Um, we did see a little bit of tarnished plant bug uh, damage. Uh, we didn't see any care weevil damage this year, and uh, we just had a little bit of aphid activity. So this report is available in our 2020 Green Book. 
And just before I finish up, I just wanted to uh, touch on the diseases that we scout and forecast for uh, through our IPM and scouting program. Um, so these include downy mildew for onion, botrytis leaf blights, demphilium, white rot, sclerotinia, white mold, and carrots, downy mildew of lettuce, and uh, general blights. Um, and these over here are all of the, uh, the forecasting models um, that we use to predict any risk. Similar for insects, uh, what we're looking for generally are onion mega fly, thrips, carrot rust fly, carrot weevil, aster leafhopper, aphids, tarnished plant bug, caterpillars. Um, we're always looking for cutworm as well. Um, some of these insects do have degree day models and uh, we use those uh, when they are available. So for our 2023 uh, IPM program, uh, we will be offering scouting as a, at the same rate as last year, $60 an acre. Uh, we will be scouting again twice per week. Um, September, we'll start scouting carrots once per week, though, um, as per usual. Uh, we'll be sending out the IPM reports again uh, twice a week, usually on Mondays and Thursdays. Um, and this will include all of your weather and pest management updates. And uh, if you'd like to sign up for scouting, uh, let me know. I'll also be calling around sometime soon as well. Um, and if you're interested in, in um, uh, following us on Twitter, we usually send out alerts or any other relevant information to the uh, Hall of Marsh. Um, and also feel free to subscribe and check out our YouTube uh, channel, Muck Crops IPM. Um, we had a, a video that we showed yesterday on carrot weevil management, and Jeff's going to show one just after this on robotics. So with that, I'd like to thank all the growers who participate in the program, um, our IPM scouts, and all of our chemical company uh, partners and uh, sponsors. Um, so with that, um, thank you for listening. And if there's time for any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thanks, Tyler. Any questions? All right. The next speaker, uh, Dr. Barry Ruth McDonald and Jeff Farintosh, FIRA World Ag Robotics video. All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for being here again today. Um, I have the easy part again, playing another video. Um, so the video we played yesterday, that was the carrot wheel video. It's kind of part of this project where we're making these short, um, hopefully educational videos of topics of concern. We handed out uh, some of those questionnaire surveys yesterday. I already read through some of them and uh, really great feedback and really interesting to see what topics are of interest. Um, so if you didn't fill out one of those and you're interested, maybe if you could raise your hand now and I'll stick Tyler on you uh, with the sheet there. Everyone got it? That's great too. Um, so this video is a little bit different. Um, because we had the camera from the other project, um, I had the opportunity to go down to Fresno, California for the FIRA USA 2022, the big North American egg conference. So I threw the camera in my carry-on, went down there and made a little bit of a video. My flight ended up getting delayed many times. So I wrote a little script in the airport and shared it with uh, the working group that Kristen was talking about earlier. Um, but I'm going to play it here today, and I hope you enjoyed as well. I'm just going to load this into the Zoom so they can see it clearly. And I'll turn off the mic, and hopefully everything works. Hey everyone, Jeff here from the Muck Crops Research Station. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to head down to Fresno, California last week for FIRA USA 2022. I wanted to share some of the footage I recorded of all the new egg robots coming to the scene, as well as other pieces of autonomous egg technology. I think we'll start slow with the products that build on current practices, and then move on to the really cool new innovative stuff, the laser readers and whatnot. Anyways, let's get started. To start, we have this autonomous kit from Blue White, which allows you to turn any tractor into a self-driving one. With various sensors and a motor on the steering column, this vehicle agnostic kit can be installed on anything from a lawnmower to a bus. Created by three Air Force veterans in Tel Aviv, this system is best used in a fleet setup where a single operator can control six to eight tractors by themselves. The kit allows for operations like spraying and data collection and is constantly being updated. But maybe you want a whole new electric tractor altogether, in which case you can look at the Monarch or the Amos, both electric autonomous tractors. For 18,000 US, the Monarch can be driven like a normal tractor or set to go solo through the fields. The low price point for this tractor is achieved by focusing on cheaper camera technology rather than more expensive LiDAR systems. The company feels that the cameras are worn enough as the tractor moves fairly slowly through the fields and will have ample time to react to any obstacles. If you want to do away with the cab altogether though, the AMOS might be what you want. AMOS stands for Autonomous Modular Omni Scalable. 
By doing away with the driver, Amos aims to reduce labor, workplace accidents, and pesticide exposure while increasing efficiency by being able to work at full capacity for eight hours at a time. The Amos is driven by an electric motor on each side of the tractor and then has one designated to the PTO. These electric tractors are also small enough to be trailered around. Other units that can increase efficiency of current practices are the Burro and the Amiga. For 20,000 US, the Burro is essentially a cart which can use vision, GPS, and AI to navigate autonomously while avoiding obstacles. The robot features what the company calls pop-up autonomy and showed how incredibly easy it is to set routes, timers, and even have the robot follow people around. The burrow can be used in a variety of settings, but currently is seeing the most use in the table grape industry, carrying grapes picked by employees to the end of the row rather than employees running the grapes themselves. The company says this increases efficiency by 20 to 30 percent, and they want to continue upgrading the platform, adding scouting capabilities and eventually the ability for the robot to pick the crops itself. The Amiga by FarmMG is an extremely compact electric tractor that's super easy to modify for whatever you need, whether it be a harvest aid, mower, seeder, spreader, cultivator, or more. This robot starts at 13,000 US for the base, and then you can buy add-ons like a three-point lip kit for another 2,000, and the company plans on developing more and more add-ons to meet the needs of consumers, including a sprayer coming out soon. The beauty of this system is that it's not exclusive to large operations and might be a prime choice for smaller producers. Speaking of small farms, many of us have seen the Nio Oz, a small farming assistant mainly used for market gardeners to help out with arduous tasks. The Oz was on display again, but Nio also brought out two of their other robots. One of those was the TED, a robot dedicated to vineyards. We got to see the TED in action, and from what we saw and heard, it seems to be especially effective at mechanical weeding, although it's got some competition, like the Vidibot from Bacchus, an extremely similar design also out of France. The Vidibot also comes with a host of tools, including the potential to add a spraying unit. There were a few dedicated spray robots on site too, like the Robotics Plus UGV or Unmanned Ground Vehicle. This robot out of New Zealand is being used to spray currently, but again has modular architecture that should allow for multiple tools to be added and swapped on going forward. Then there's the Gus and Mini Gus, which are purely designed to spray. While the robot isn't flexible in its use scenarios, it's allowed the company to optimize the platform to be really, really good at what it can do, which is spraying. The software allows one operator to control eight units at a time, and the unit can sense trees and spray precise amounts to reduce material costs and drift. Another neat feature the company has is a special safety vest, which the robot can easily sense even through thick canopies to shut down when an employee is near. Jumping back to Nio now, this is the first time I got to see the Oreo, which we're hoping to work with in the near future. The Oreo is an electric robot, armed with a camera and high precision GPS to allow it to carry along various weeding tools, and possibly more in the future. I had seen videos of the Oreo mounted with a few different cultivators before, but at Fira it had something new, an in-row weeding tool by Kult, which could detect and avoid the crop using a camera and focus on getting the weeds. The cooled units can be installed on various platforms, like the Agro and Tele Robotti, and also showed off a unit that can be pulled behind a tractor. Unfortunately, the trial had been watered shortly before the demonstration, which may have reduced the efficacy of the implement. Stout was also there with their smart cultivator, a very similar system that also seemed extremely effective. In one of the lightning talks earlier in the week, Dr. Steve Fenimore from UC Davis shared that in their trials, the stout had reduced hand weeding by 60 to 62% and resulted in 89 to 99% weed control. His team had also found a significant reduction in weeds thanks to another unit too, the Farmwise Titan FT35. This unit is again similar, but at the field day, it was being pulled by an autonomous carriage as well. The Titan is easy to adjust and sells their product as a service, charging growers per acre to use their weeding robot. Another autonomous, self-driven weeding robot most of us will recognize is Le Chevre, or the GOAT, from Nexus Robotics. Featuring new racing stripes installed the morning of the show, the Nexus uses robotic arms and grippers to pull weeds and has been getting some runtime in lettuce fields and Salinas. There was another unit there which looked similar to the Nexus, but featured a very different method of killing the weeds. Lasers. 
Carbon Robotics had brought down their demo unit to let all of us experience the thrill of weeds erupting, sizzling, smoking, and leaving only small pieces of burnt glass behind on the sandy soil. This robot pulses lights that are four times brighter than the sun for just one millisecond in every 10, allowing it to clearly see what it's doing regardless of time of day. The unit here isn't actually for sale, as the company is currently focusing on catering to larger operations, so instead they're selling a giant unit, 20 feet wide, with 30 lasers on board. There were some similar designs to the Carbon Robotics new implement, although instead of shooting lasers, some of them could spray herbicides with extreme precision, like the unit from Eco Robotics, or there's the one from Verdant, which is set up to shoot jets of a non-aerated, biological weed control concoction right at the weeds. The company bragged that they could shoot ants with pinpoint precision crawling underneath the implement, but for whatever reason it wasn't operating that day. As you can tell, there are a lot of wild ideas out there, and companies are all borrowing from each other trying to reach market-ready solutions first. These are just a few of the front runners I had the opportunity to see, although there are many more out there, and we noted lots of employees from much bigger companies taking note of what these startups are up to. Driving the three hours from San Francisco to Fresno was eye-opening to me, as most of our trip was lined with huge agricultural operations on both sides of the highway. While California might seem like the perfect place for these companies to get their foothold in the North American market, the Occupational Safety and Health Standards Board recently rejected a petition from Monarch to allow autonomous tractors, and many within the state worry that they won't be able to use any of the incredible emerging technology. That said, hopefully some of it can find a home here in Ontario. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed this little robot roundup and have a great day. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, so we're mixing the schedule up a bit. Uh, next, we're going to hear from OFEGA policy update. Chris and Stefan. Is Stefan here today? Stephon, yeah, Stefan uh, on Zoom. On Zoom, on Zoom. awesome. So, yeah, Hi, we Stephon. have a combined presentation here today. So I'm Chris Gugelshaw with the Ontario Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. My colleague Stefan Laras is on the Zoom. He's going to start out. Uh, he's the policy advisor at covering labor and safety nets. And I am policy advisor on crop protection. So we work on uh, policy issues that are common across the edible horticulture industry. And Stefan is going to start with an update on labor and safety nets. So um, hopefully we'll be able to hear Stefan. And otherwise, we'll be just like home talking to myself. Um, this will be a bit of a scattershot update on uh, on uh, safety nets and policy issues, just uh, a, a lay of the land on some of the highlights. Um, safety nets first. For the current uh, program year that started April 1st, AgSAB, uh, folks are going to see the federal government uh, matching what's already been in place from the province, so 80 cents on the dollar of losses uh, beyond the 30% um, the deductible in your AgSAB production margin. Um, so that's going to be a roughly a 8% uh, or so increase to payments if you're in a payment situation. Um, on crop insurance, labor peril coverage that was in place during uh, the pandemic is going to be discontinued. And, um, and so that will be no longer in place for the 2023 crop insurance year. For SDRM right now, there is, uh, it's, it's been a priority area for industry lobbying. We're lobbying with the livestock uh, commodities that have the SDRM RMP program and the grain and oil seeds commodities. We've been lobbying for a two thirds uh, increase to the, the current program funding. Um, getting, we got fairly close in the fall, but uh, didn't get that one across the finish line. So that's gonna be a, a priority for the current year. And hopefully we'll see, uh, we'll have something better to announce in time for the 2024 year. Now on the advanced payments program, I know some of, uh, some of the crops um, attending today uh, use the APP. Uh, this year is the last year uh, that the interest rate portion is, uh, is, um, is in place. So Minister Bibo has announced that after this year, so come uh, April, 2024, um, we'll be looking at just $100,000 of interest free. So um, I know that uh, the Ag Credit Corp Corporation here in Ontario is still um, receiving applications, so it's not too late. I think the interest free 
uh, amount that's in place this year is um, roughly of a, at a 6% loan rate. Um, the, the financial value of that is about $20,000, just above that. Uh, we are working with our national partners to get that extended because uh, for those that use the program, it is those 20,000 or so, those are, uh, that's obviously valuable. Uh, beyond 2023, the feds are working on, um, uh, we're working with industry on um, um, some administrative simplifications to agri stability. So that wouldn't be more money, but potentially would uh, save growers um, costs on the accountant side. So I don't know if the accountants in the room are as excited about this, but um, a couple of the changes that are being uh, considered is to allow, um, allow the, uh, basically not have to make a full claim every year unless you're certain that you're in a claim situation so you don't have to submit your full accru accrual information um, and then you can essentially just file say with your cash filing if you're a cash filer and you don't have to um, to uh, to do that additional accounting work to um, to transition that to accru accrual and if you ever do trigger and you you have to submit your accrual information in a claim year then your past years can remain at a, on a cash basis. So again, it's, it's more on the accountant fee savings than anything else. That would include um, simplifying the... Uh, Chris just asked if we're ready to move on. Yeah, we're on the second slide. Sorry, I forgot that folks can't see my screen. We're on the slide, uh, safety nets, medium term outlook. Um, moving on to agri recovery, I know that uh, that's more of a regional thing. I don't know if uh, Muck Crops has uh, applied for that program, but it's basically ad hoc disaster funding, and it hasn't really worked that well for Ontario. So that's being uh, reviewed. Both MJ has inputted into that uh, process, and hopefully that uh, that ad hoc kind of disaster funding uh, program that the feds offer will be um, will be revised and, and updated in time. Uh, for the next time that we need it. So there's a, there's a report back expected this fall. Uh, crop insurance, uh, OMAFRA and Agricor are, have, been, uh, re have received direction from the feds that they should be issuing one pilot at least uh, in the next uh, five years. And the pilot would be a incentive uh, to um, crop insurance that is linked to environmental best practices. So at this point, that's, uh, that's still in the really early stages. Um, and we're looking at more something along the lines of a government report before anything changes with um, with premiums. Um, the assurance that we've gotten from the feds is that it won't uh, it won't be a um, requirement, but it will be on a voluntary basis. And folks that do want to ever engage in a best practice would um, experience incentives rather than the other way around that it's required or that there's penalties. Um, again, on the advanced payments program starting 2024, we'll have to lobby successfully to keep uh, the, the feds from going back to that old, smaller uh, interest rate limit. Um, 2025, the feds have uh, made it clear that uh, if your ANS um, is above a million dollars, they will be requiring something along the lines of an EFP. So that's for Ontario, that's the environmental farm plan. And um, adding to your agri-invest account will be conditional on having an EFP in place. That doesn't mean that um, it doesn't affect your ability to withdraw. So even if you didn't have an EFP in 2025, you could still withdraw, but adding to the uh, account would be conditional on having an EFP. Uh, moving on to the next slide, the long-term outlook, um, ag staff still remains um, of a fairly modest value to a lot of growers in our industry. And the the long-term focus is to still come at uh, something that's more crop specific. Um, and we know that uh, that grains and oilseed has their RMP program and, um, and at the national level, the work is in progress to, to try to explore something like that for the edible hort sector. So I've got a few slides on um, industry led work is happening and then AFC is working on something that basically looks like this. It would, it's called revenue insurance, uh, roughly modeled after what's happening in the US. Um, the, uh, the feds are planning on rolling out some, some pilot in the grains and all seed sector, uh, depending on if they, they get um, kind of their cabinet approval at the federal level. And it would roughly be uh, your expected acreage, your expected uh, yield. Um, so for those in crop insurance, that would be basically numbers that you submit to Agri for. And, uh, and 
the expected price. So that would be your, your claim price and multiply those together. You get your expected revenue and that would be a reference point. The way that the feds would calculate it is that you eventually um, uh, compare your actual revenue, so actual production, actual price to what you insured against and the difference would be the indemnity. So it's similar to Agacor's production margin compared to the reference margin. Only this one would be based on your expected revenue against your actual revenue. And uh, I think the twist there that's relevant to our sector is that um, the feds are willing to entertain crop um, specific riders to this idea of whole farm revenue. And we have that happening in the US right now. We've got uh, four crops that have crop level revenue insurance already, sweet corn, field tomatoes, potatoes, and bell peppers. And the uptake is quite good. So those were developed by, um, by insurance companies in the States. They don't have Agricor, they have private insurance. And so the, the, the a bit more innovative kind of uh, product development in the, in the States happening. So there is, there is, uh, there's precedent for this happening. I don't think we're looking at anything be, uh, before five years from now. So this is more of a kind of looking down the, the pipeline. Uh, can we move on to labor real quick? Um, and I don't think I wanna dwell on, on all the regulation updates. Folks have probably at, at this point, um, I heard enough from, ag from, uh, from farms and from ESCC on that front. So why don't we go to the OHIP card slide? So that's the next one. Um, we've, heard, we've heard that employers have had uh, challenges with uh, making appointments for the photo ID uh, renewal um, for, their, for the workers' health cards. Um, the one thing I want folks to take away if you're looking at the OHIP photo renewal slide is the one, the one window approach through the mfw.moh at ontario.ca um, email account. That one looks at all the service on Ontario sites within your vicinity. And it also looks at uh, pop-up um, locations that are provided by Ministry of Health. And uh, so it would be able to find you more than what, um, what is on the Service Ontario website. It would, it would be able to, through this email, you can have access to the pop-up sites, which is a, a bonus and highly recommended that you go through that email process. As you can see, when you email them, um, you wanna include the name of the farm, uh, the, the location, phone number, email address. This is just for the uh, employer, of course. Uh, the number of workers that need um, a card renewal um, and the approximate date of arrival. And uh, if you want to do that about two weeks or, or more before the estimated date of arrival of the workers. And uh, once the appointment has been confirmed by email, um, when you bring the workers in, I know some, uh, some experiences are that, uh, that you get turned away um, because of incomplete amount of documentation there. So the forms you want to bring is the, the registration for Ontario insurance, um, the health insurance coverage form. Uh, OpenBJ is going to be sending out a reminder um, with the links to those forms, the previous, a previous health number, uh, address of the farm, the passport, and the work permit. Um, so those, that's basically, uh, those two steps should get every worker in the, uh, in the group um, fully processed with a new card. Um, I think I'll leave it there, Chris. We've got lots of work happening on the media front, uh, more than a migrant worker, and uh, um, we we have been engaging on uh, with with negative publicity or negative media activities. You know, there was a critical article and uh, and videos at CHCH Hamilton, and uh, and so if you look at the media slide, I think. Chris, I'll leave it with you if you want to read any of those out. But I think those are the key messages that uh, that media and um, and the editors at those media outlets need to hear is uh, that the programs that growers use are extremely um, are highly regulated with a lot of oversight. And to try to lump uh, our growers that use these programs together with uh, human trafficking and and bringing those in into one sentence is extremely hurtful. It's uh, dangerous. It implies that farmers are operating uh, without rules and with no regard for human rights, which is the furthest from the truth. And it undermines public confidence in, in our agriculture sector. And, uh, and so any issues with human rights uh, or human trafficking need to be completely separated out from, uh, from the SOP and the action program. So 
that's the key message and that we got lots of work to do on that front to educate the editors and the journalists out there. Um, and uh, I don't think I have time for the more than a migrant worker campaign, but that uh, that remains ongoing and we'll be um, we'll be sending updates to politicians and to the media to make them aware of that campaign as well. Chris, I'll leave it at that. I've got to bounce. And since I can't hear Perfect. I'll... Yep. Thank you very much for that update, Stefan. And um, appreciate all of the work that you do on a very important uh, part of uh, our uh, association work on the labor and, and safety nets update. So um, if there's any questions on that for, for Stefan, uh, just let me know and we can uh, get you in touch with him. He can answer any specific questions about that. I guess on Stefan's comment, uh, one of the projects that Open VGA has undertaken is this more than a migrant worker campaign, which is um, to uh, put some facts out there about, um, about temporary foreign workers and the work that they do in Canada. And uh, so that's something that we've seen an increased need for at the association level is um, is putting out some facts when there's uh, so much activism against uh, certain aspects of agriculture. So um, that's, I think, most of our time. I, I'm going to go back to crop protection. I have I have a few updates on that. That's more more my area. Um, and fortunately, Josh actually covered a fair bit of that. So appreciate having uh, having the new Jim Chaput and Josh did a great job covering that. Um, so. Here's kind of just what Stefan was mentioning, the More Than Migrant Work campaign. You can check that out. Um, we've gotten some good traffic through that. I don't know. He had five minutes. He's got 20 slides in here. So, uh, Stefan. Um, okay, crop protection. Um, yeah, Josh covered this. Chlorothalonil, no news. Good news. I agree. Um, so, uh, Syngenta did a lot of work to look at that again. And one of the things that we did responding to the to, to the chlorothalonil reevaluation was really look at um, which crops really really needed it and were using it. Um, it was registered still on quite a few crops. There was a lot of crops that it was nice to have chlorothalonil, and no one wants to give up a multi-site fungicide. Uh, but there was a few crops where there was nothing else, and so it was important, really important, to keep it there. Um, so I guess stay tuned on that. And um, as for this year, it's it's uh, as normal in terms of using chlorothalonil. Uh, Mancazeb, big change this year is no more carrots. Uh, no more carrots, no more celery for Mancazeb. The transition period is done. So if you have Mancazeb around, it still can be used on onions, but not on carrots this year. So that's a change. And chlorpyrifos, this is this is it. This is the swan song for chlorpyrifos last year. This. Sun is setting at the end of the year, um, so never to come back again. Uh, if you do have chlorpyrifos, still you can use it in Canada. It remains legal to be used under phase out until the end of the year. The MRLs remain unchanged in Canada, so uh, legal to sell the product with chlor chlorpyrifos MRLs domestically. If there is export of that product, however, there is no more US MRLs. They got canceled last year, and so the residues are not acceptable in the US market. And to avoid any issues, it's best not to use chlorpyrifos on any crops to be exported. Uh, Josh covered the tank mixing issue. I think the, the biggest thing to highlight here is uh, the two-year transition period. So it's really the 2025 season in this case that we're going to be looking at this. Uh, there's still a lot of um, unknowns about how this is going to roll out. So but basically, we're looking at adding this short paragraph on there. Um, that's one option in terms of permitting tank mixing. Uh, the other option is going to be going back to the previous way of adding the specific combination. So just an example here, uh, product A mixed with product B and instructions. Um, so that's that's a second option. It remains to be seen how this is all going to roll out. Um, quick note on compliance inspections. This is from uh, Health Canada's um, PMRA compliance people. Just uh, they go around uh, every year and do some uh, farm inspections just noted uh, about expired products that they were finding in um, in, in spray sheds. 99% um, of the time, this is just an accident. It's a, it's a legal product uh, that uh, got phased out through, through re-evaluation just in the corner of the spray shed and you know no one's using it anymore, but it's just there. So just a note to uh, just mark off those products and um, get rid of them at the next clean farms. And then uh, I guess wanted to finish on uh, an optimistic tone Thursday afternoon, Friday holiday. Um, so talk about novel products in development. Um, I think there's a few exciting things coming down the pipe. 
Um, this is not everything that's new in onions and carrots. So um, it's just a, a few things that are being worked on currently through the minor use program. But uh, in one week, we got two new fungicide groups, which is actually pretty astonishing. Um, so first one is Adevelt from Corteva, which is floral picoximid, which is a group 21 fungicide. Um, it's a brand new group for non-omycete pathogens. There was another 21 that we have, but it only works on omycetes. So this one does work on true fungi. Um, apparently a pretty uh, broad range of them. Um, so it was just registered in Canada for various field crops, uh, most notably Cercospora and sugar beets for, for horticulture. Um, and there's minor use projects on the books right now for leaf blights and carrots um, and for onion botrytis. And given our situation with mancozeb and, uh, and, and chlorothalonil, it's good to have a new group there. And then uh, Picarbutrazox is a new uh, mycete fungicide. So working on uh, downy mildews pythium from Niso. Another unique mode of action, just registered a couple of years ago. It's only a seed treatment for corn and, so corn and soy so far, but there's an onion downy mildew minor use project on the go. So that would be a new group there. Roflanolide, uh, we heard about earlier for the um, onion maggot. So group 30, uh, new uh, insecticide mode of action, registered October, 2020. It's wireworms and potatoes and grains only so far, but there is an onion, onion maggot, seed corn maggot project on the books. And uh, Syngenta is actually uh, about to develop a new group 30 foliar mode of action, flinazolin, which Mary Ruth mentioned earlier. Um, so there is some exciting new stuff coming. Unfortunately, in the weeds, it's a very, very small, uh, small amount of new stuff coming. Uh, we heard yesterday from Clarence, a new possible mode of action for carrots, which is pretty exciting. Um, although it's not new technology, it's just newly marketed to North America. But I did see, I think FMC has got a brand new herbicide group that they're working on. And I think a Japanese company does as well. So there is some new stuff coming, but it takes a while. So with that, thank you very much. And we got to move on. Thanks very much, Chris. So the next speaker is Eric Phillips from Syngenta with an industry update. All right. Good afternoon. And uh, thanks for the opportunity here uh, to give you a Brief in a update on Syngenta's portfolio and uh, some of the changes that we have for you this season. Uh, as Matt said, my name is Eric Phillips. I'm a horticultural specialist with Syngenta, uh, one of two colleagues uh, in the province that manage horticulture. Uh, my contact information is on screen. And uh, what I want to review here with you this afternoon is uh, some portfolio changes. So get to play good cop, bad cop, unfortunately, with some things. Uh, talk about a couple of new products, probably in Arondas Gold. Uh, we'll review some crop spray programs in carrots and onions, and then close on a conversation around biologicals and some of the investments that we've made in this space here recently. Uh, so portfolio changes for 2023. Uh, so the good news, uh, refocused our efforts with Aprovia. Uh, so this is a standalone group seven uh, registered in several different crops, including vegetables. And we'll talk a bit about its uh, expectations and performance in onions. And then Arondis Gold. So a combination of Ritamil and Arondis. So two very effective active ingredients. Uh, expanded that product into several different uh, vegetable crops, including bulb vegetables. And uh, looking to be the new standard for downy mildew control going forward. Uh, so neither Josh or Claris played bad cop, uh, so I have to do that now and inform you of some changes on the, the portfolio side. Uh, so Ritamil Gold MZ uh, is discontinued, uh, so you have a three-year period to use this product. Uh, so if you do have stock, uh, we recommend that you use it up in the next couple of years. And uh, due, so, due to some uh, reevaluation decisions on the part of the PMRA, uh, there are some feeding restrictions around lambda cyhalothrin, so the active ingredient in matador, uh, I guess silencer and la bamba, as well as volium expressed. And as a result of that, uh, there are some canceled uses and some feeding restrictions. Uh, the big one here, of course, is the canceled use in onions for the 2023 season. Looking at Aprovia now, uh, so we'll jump into some of the new products. So as I mentioned, a standalone group seven, 
Uh, you could see in the top right corner, it is an EC formulation. And one case will treat 40 acres. Uh, the table shows you some of the uses that it's registered on. Of course, our target in onions here is going to be stem philium. Uh, we've got a single use rate. Uh, while labeled up to four applications, uh, we are not recommending four applications of this product. And you can see some convenient PHI and re-entry intervals. Uh, moving on to Arondis Gold, uh, as I mentioned, so a combination of two very effective products. So this is a group four and a group 49. Uh, and a case will treat uh, close to 48 acres, uh, registered on several different crops, but recently expanded into bulb vegetables. Downy mildew is our target. And again, the single use rate here. Uh, and I will show you a bit of information on its performance. Uh, this is two trials granted, and one of them was conducted last year with very low pressure. Uh, but as I said, taking two rock star molecules and combining them, uh, as I said, looking to be the new standard for downy mildew protection uh, this upcoming season. Uh, if we look at spray programs now, uh, starting off with carrots, uh, of course, not you know, can't get through a season with just a Syngenta portfolio. Uh, we recommend that you do mix your chemistries and uh, use other complementary products. Uh, but if we think about uh, management for our molds and our leaf blights, uh, Quadris Top continues to be a very effective Alternaria and Circosper product. We recommend you start the season with that application. Uh, further on into the season, some rotation and applications with Bravo. Uh, picking up Miravis Duo, which has some white mold suppression. And then as we heard yesterday in the co carrot conversation, Allegro being uh, that difference maker when it comes to white mold later on in the season. Uh, with onions, uh, again, how to manage for stemphilium and some of the other different diseases. And if I was on your farm last year, I probably told you to start spraying for stemphilium at the three leaf stage. And you would have said, Eric, there is quite a bit of dirt at that timing. And I said, you're right, there is. But three leaf stage is when we need to start considering to make applications for stemphilium. I think if we think about the pathogen and manage it like farmers are uh, with apples and scabs, it's managing that primary infection period. And so putting your most effective products early on to manage that is shown to be very effective in apples. And we believe that's a, a sound strategy here with stem philium and onions. So a product like Caprovia or Miravis Dua early on in the season, manage that primary infection period. And then again, as you uh, go, go through the season, uh, see what chemistries and the level of pressure that you have uh, to uh, manage some of the other diseases and the level of pressure that you see later on in the season. Uh, switching gears, I want to talk biologicals here quickly. Uh, again, a broad term when it comes to biologicals. Uh, when we at Syngenta think about biologicals, we categorize that into three different groups. We call what we have on the left here is biocontrols. So these are biological products that manage biotic stresses. So insects, weeds, diseases. Uh, we've got the middle cat category, which is biostimulants. Uh, these products like these uh, manage abiotic stresses. So too hot, too cold, too wet, too dry, things that we can't control uh, with uh, our conventional chemistries. And then on the last piece is biofertility. Uh, so this is all about nutrient management. And in this space, we've got a product in Invita. I want to spend a couple of minutes uh, just introducing you to uh, the two products that I'll focus on here uh, this afternoon, which is Megafol and Invita. Uh, so what is Megafol? As I said, it's a biostimulant. Uh, so this is all about managing those uh, uh, abiotic stresses, right? Uh, it's derived from algae, uh, you know, grown in, Nor I guess, in this case, Norwegian algae at high tide. Uh, it's surviving in freezing cold water at low tide. It's baking in the sun. And so we extract some of these uh, components from that plant and formulate it into uh, a product that can upregulate genes and help recover uh, your crops uh, during periods of stress. So wound response, heat stress, cold stress, and several different other uh, stresses that might occur in the season. A bit on the product itself. Uh, well, you see here a recommendation or a, a labeled rate of one acre 
uh, one liter per acre on a 14 day interval. It's been our experience that half rates on shorter intervals has been more effective. Uh, obviously timing this product ahead of a stress is not that easy. And so to have a bit of product in your crops a little more frequently with, like I said, a half rate and a shorter interval allows you to be uh, more effective to time that application and manage through some of those stress periods that you see throughout the season. Uh, the last piece here is Invita. Uh, so what is Invita? Uh, it's a naturally occurring bacteria. Uh, unlike Alana, I am not going to be able to pronounce ours, so I will just call it GD. Uh, so GD is, a, uh, as I said, a bacteria that has been sourced in sugarcane, uh, actually identified and developed in 1988. Uh, we are on our 19th iteration of the formulation, so that bacteria continues to evolve. And ultimately, what we're doing here is fixing nitrogen, right? So you heard a bit about Utricia N this morning. Uh, Invita is a similar product to that. It fixes nitrogen from the atmosphere. Uh, the product details, uh, again, single use rate here, so 95 mils per acre, uh, you got 40 acres a jug or 160 acres in a case. Uh, we are dealing with a biological, as Alana said, so we do have to treat it a little differently than we do our conventional chemistries. Uh, don't let it freeze, don't let it sit in the sunlight, uh, ensure you have a proper application volumes in terms of water. And again, getting it on the stomata earlier on in the morning when those dews are there is most uh, is, is, has been proven to be most effective. Uh, lots to learn in this space. Admittedly, uh, when it comes to a crop protection product from Syngenta, we usually have 10 years of data to, to tell you about uh, the development of that product. In this case, we've actually acquired the distribution rights to it. So this is be our second season with it. Uh, so I'm encouraged and excited to be working along with you this season to see and experiment how this product performs in your carrots and onions. Uh, I heard an interesting stat yesterday. There are 70 million pounds of nitrogen above every acre in, in, in the marsh. So if a product like that can tap into almost a fraction of that, think about the potential that we have uh, with our nitrogen su supplementation. So I've taken up my 10 minutes. Uh, again, want to thank you for the opportunity. I wish you all the best this growing season and uh, be happy to entertain any questions or uh, conversation over the season. Thank you very much. Thanks, sir. Sorry, question? Yeah, so historically, a Provia top has been in the market. It's a group seven and a group three. Uh, the, the transition or the focus with a Provia allows for a slightly easier rotation, right? Uh, removing the three from that allows you to give you a bit more flexibility on whatever additional products you're making or applications for Stemphilium. That's the, yeah, the target, again, with all our products, it's, it's suppression. So we're in that 60 to 80% activity, but uh, yes. Yep. Thanks very much, Eric. All right, our next speaker, Brian Nault, Sumi is joining us virtually. So an onion maggot and onion thrift update. Yes, good afternoon. Let me get my screen shared here. Sorry, Brian, just one second. We'll get you up here. Oh, yeah. Yep. Okay, go ahead. All right, great. Well, thanks for inviting me to talk about um, onion maggot and thrips management and onion. I've certainly wanted to be there in person, but I had a previous speaking engagement earlier today. So I'm going to have to do it this way. So hopefully, uh, we won't lose too much quality <laughs> by um, using the, the Zoom today. So at any rate, I'm um, going to talk about Onion Maggot and Thrips update. And no big surprise, I'd like to talk a little bit about insecticide seed treatments for maggot control, and then also some guidelines that um, we've been sharing with our growers in terms of what we think they should consider for treatment 
uh, seed treatment um, use. And then for thrips, an update on insecticide options. And then also I'll talk a little bit about the guidelines that we recommend our growers use uh, for uh, the insecticides that are registered for thrips control on onion. Um, in particular, in a, to use in a manner that would mitigate resistance development. So here are the two major maggots that attack onion down south, <laughs> same as the ones that you all battle. They include the seed corn maggot, Delia platura, and I've always considered it more of a sporadic pest of onion in New York. And then we have the onion maggot, Delia antiqua, which has always been considered the major pest of onion in New York. Couple uh, comparisons between the two species. First of all, seed corn maggot feeds on decaying organic material, but as we all know, they'll also attack onions and other vegetable crops. Uh, it overwinters as a puparium in the soil and adults will typically emerge anywhere from late April through early to mid-May. Uh, the adults will lay eggs in the soil and they'll have anywhere from three to five generations per year. The onion maggot, on the other hand, exclusively feeds on onion and other related crops in the allium genus. So it's a, sp a specific um, uh, pest for those particular crops. And But otherwise, it's very similar to the seed corn maggot in that it overwinters as a puparium in the soil. The adults emerge maybe a, a smidge later than the seed corn maggots. They also lay eggs at the base of plants, and they only have three generations per year um, in New York. Now, these graphs here illustrate the activity of the different fly species. So in the top, we have seed corn maggot. On the bottom, we have onion maggot. And the line there just shows the number of moth, or excuse me, the number of flies that were captured per trap. And you just notice here that the seed corn maggot adults or flies tend to be active just a little bit earlier than the onion maggot flies. And I've always figured that, well, because of that, we're gonna see seed corn maggot damage in onions a bit earlier in the season compared to onion maggot. Not a lot earlier, but maybe you know, a week or two. So I have a graduate student that um, sampled damaged onions on four different farms in Oswego and Wayne counties in New York. And here are those data. The, the y-axis is the mean number of maggots in plants that were sampled over time with the yellowish looking line as onion maggot and the purple line as seed corn maggot. So per, you know, based on the emergence of seed corn maggot earlier than onion maggot in general, I would have expected to see seed corn maggot damage before onion maggot damage. And that wasn't the case. We didn't see anything until the 31st of May. And right off the bat, we found more onion maggot damage than seed corn maggot. And that trend continued all the way until the end of that first generation. Um, the same graduate student added a few more farms um, in collaboration with Christy Hopetain in Western New York and Ethan Grunberg in Eastern New York, and basically generated this information. So here we have the proportion of species that were either onion maggot in yellow or seed corn maggot in purple on the seven different farms. And you see, not a big surprise, a majority of those maggots that were pulled from those damaged plants were onion maggot compared with seed corn maggot. But, um, and we had an overall average of 90% of the, the maggots were onion maggot compared with seed corn maggot. Uh, the range of seed corn maggot was maybe 6% to 18%. So it's not insignificant. And I also would say that I wouldn't consider that sporadic a sporadic pest either. Uh, seed corn maggot was found very consistently on all of the farm sampled. Uh, we, we intend to repeat this next year. But um, the bottom line is that even though onion maggot is the dominant species, I think we really need to consider management of both species. And that means using seed treatments that have activity against both. So if an insecticide is not used at planting, it's very likely that you can have a huge losses in plant stand, as you can see in this photo here in this field in Wayne County where no insecticide basically allowed the, the maggots to have at those onions compared with on the right side, 
This was far more FI 500 C treatment package that included spinosad and, uh, well, primarily spinosad is the C treatment that was doing most of the work. So a question that I'm sure that you all have is, are there any new insecticides for maggot control? And technically the answer is yes, at least in the United States. And when I say technically, it's because it's a new seed treatment called Lumiverd. However, the active ingredient is not new. The active ingredient is spinosad. And spinosad is the same active ingredient in Regard SC that Syngenta used in their far more FI 500 package. So it's only new in name and the company now is, um, Corteva is keeping it to themselves now. So at any rate, um, it is also OMRI approved just like Regard SC was OMRI approved. Um, it's a commercial seed treatment. So it's not something that you can buy and treat seeds on your own. And it's currently registered in California, Washington, Nebraska, and Idaho, where most of the major seed coating companies are located. And um, our growers have seed treated with Lumiverd this year and will be planting them this year. So back to that question, are there new insecticides for maggot control? Well, the answer is no, there are not, but there is one in the pipeline and I heard it mentioned just a few minutes ago. And right now, Syngenta is calling it planazolin technology. The active ingredient is isocycloserum. I was promised that uh, Syngenta will come up with a, an easier name to pronounce than planazolin. Uh, but at any rate, uh, it's an isoxazoline insecticide. So a brand new class 30, it inhibits the gabagated chloride channel. Uh, previous performance of planazolin technology in my field trials in New York was only mediocre. And I talked with some of the, the folks at Syngenta about these results and requested if there was any chance that we could evaluate a higher concentration. And the answer was yes. So that was good news. And also th there was some interest in knowing whether or not there could be some added benefit of combining planazolin technology with Cruiser, which is thiamethoxam, a neonic. So indeed, last year, uh, conducted a couple trials in New York where we examined planazolin technology at the rate that I had looked at it before, at this 0 0.0606 milligram per seed rate, and then the higher rate, um, the 0.0909 uh, milligram per seed rate. And then um, also looked at adding a little bit of cruiser to that uh, seed treatment. And then the standards in the trial were regard plus cruiser. So there was still a little bit of regard left that Syngenta had. And that's the, the typical far more FI 500 with regard that our growers have been using since like 2011, maybe. Um, and then we also had TriGuard, which I believe you all call governor, and then cruiser. And that's what we call the Farmore FI500 with TriGuard. So those are the two standards. And then a fungicide only control. And the fungicide only control included the Farmore F300 package and then also Evergold Prime for onion smut control. And here are the results from one of those trials. Uh, the results were similar at both locations, but in the interest of time, I'll just share one of those trials with you. Um, so on the y-axis, we have the percentage of plants killed by onion maggot. Again, in this field, a majority, over 90% were onion maggot. Um, and then for all of the different treatments. And what I did here, um, and, and this is cumulative. So basically all of the plants killed by onion maggots in that first generation. So from, from May through the end of June, first couple uh, days of July. So what we see is that with a fungicide only control, 60% of the plants were killed by maggots. If we look at our two standards, which would be the far more F500 with regard or spinosad, and then the far more F500 with trigard or governor, we see that both of those performed really, really well. If we now move over to the middle and look at planazolin, we see that the mid rate, which is the rate I had evaluated before, didn't look that great. It wasn't horrible, but certainly not as good as what it our growers would want. And then we see that the higher rate 
um, was numerically better, but not statistically better than the mid rate in this particular field. But if we add a little bit of cruiser to either the low rate of planazolin or the high rate, we get levels of control that were equivalent to our two standards. So basically, this gives us some promise that there is something in the pipeline that could be really, really good. I did have an opportunity to look at uh, planazolin technology also in a different trial last year here on four different farms, and I kept it simple. We had either the fungicide-only control, which is exactly like the one that I just told you about. We had TriGuard by itself, Regard by itself, and then the planazolin technology at that high rate. And here are the results on those four farms. So we see that the fungicide only, we had pretty good pressure in three of the four farms, 73, 62, and almost 76% of the plants killed by onion maggots with only 14% on this uh, last farm. And then we see with TriGuard, Regard and Planazlin, they all provided pretty much an equivalent level of control. So again, this, and now this one farm, I just will mention this farm number one has always had really, really high maggot pressure. And a lot of the products just don't perform as well there as they do in some of the other places. I think that's pretty obvious looking at the data. But the bottom line and the takeaway here is that Planazlin technology at this high rate appears to be um, something that's going to be promising in the future, assuming that it does become registered in the U.S. Um, I'd like to also talk a little bit about what we have been uh, suggesting our growers consider when it comes to using particular seed treatments for maggot control. And um, so essentially, we, we rated um, the products is either excellent for maggot control, fair to poor, good to fair, or just poor. And these, basically, this is, um, these uh, uh, opinions, I'll say, were based on experience uh, that I've had working with these products over um, many years. But also Christy Hopeting, who may or may not still be in the audience right now, um, and then collaborators Rob Wilson from California, Tim Waters from Washington, and Stuart Wrights from Oregon. I, I guess I, I already knew Mary Ruth and Kevin's opinion of Suppresto were as being something that works pretty well. But, but at any rate, um, this is kind of a, a collective uh, opinion of how these products work. So at the top, we have Lumiverd or Spinosad, which is excellent against both maggot species because out west, in the Western United States. Um, they primarily have seed core maggot, not very many onion maggots, and Lumiverd works really, really well for those seed core maggots. For TriGuard, uh, works really well against onion maggot. It does not do very well against seed corn maggot. They will not use it in Western, in the Western US. Cruiser, not very good at all against onion maggot. And for the folks out West, for seed corn maggot, it's been fair to poor. And then Suppresto, unfortunately, in my trials, it has never done very well. Uh, very disappointing. Not really sure why. Um, and then for sea corn maggot, the folks out west have said that it's good to fare. And I know that it's maybe your, the, the standard choice for you all up in Ontario and, and Quebec. And then finally, we do have a seed treatment package that is going to be commonly used this year. Uh, throughout the Great Lakes region. And that's called, well, Alternative Farmore FI500. I guess that's more my term of it, but it's got the TriGuard, the Cruiser, and um, the Farmore F300 um, fungicide package. So what concerns me is the Cruiser part of that package, because I just told you that you know, it's considered only fair to pour against seed core maggot. And we, and I just also showed you that seed core maggot is going to be found in pretty much every onion field. So um, I feel like it's important to do some research to identify if there's a better product that could be used with TriGuard in particular that could control seed core maggots. So this year, we've got this massive 12 treatment trial. It's going to be replicated in New York in three locations, two in kind of central New York and Oswego County, one in Orange County in the southeastern part of the state. Uh, Mary Ruth and Kevin are going to uh, 
conduct it there, probably on the Bradford Marsh. And then um, also in California, in the Tule Lake region of Northern California, and then somewhere in Eastern Washington. Okay, so just real quick, the, the um, treatments include kind of our standards. We have Trigard, the Lumiverd, which is our spinosad, the Planazlin technology at the high rate, Cruiser by itself, Suppresto by itself. So we have basically all of the different possibilities by it themselves, but then down here, treatments seven through 12 are different combinations. And again, really focused in particular at trying to find a really good partner for Trigard that um, could control the seed corn maggots, but also um, could be used in a manner that might not be a problem for exacerbating insecticide resistance in onion maggot populations. So that's a good segue into the last part I'm gonna talk about for maggot control, and that's an insecticide resistance management strategy. And really it's key, just like a lot of other types of insecticide resistance management strategies, it's really important to rotate active ingredients that belong to different modes of action of different classes. So that's kind of the strategy I want our growers to use and you all should consider. So just real quick, going back to the biology of the onion maggot. So we've got three generations per year. And if you're gonna use a seed treatment, it's only gonna be effective against that first generation because basically it's gonna run out of gas typically before the second generation. Yeah, you might get a little bit of second generation, but by far and large, it's gonna just select uh, for against that first generation. So that means that the other two generations are free of selection, which means that, and that's a good thing overall. So that uh, only one out of three generations per year will be selected to be potentially resistant. So um, the idea here would be, I know a lot of our growers have the far more FI 500 with Trigard this year. So if they do that in 2023, but then next year use Lumabird, which is spinosad, which should again, could control both maggot species, but we're focusing on onion maggot resistance management here, is that Technically, in a particular onion field where you have an onion maggot population that's probably fairly residential, it's not going to move too far, that only one out of six generations over that two-year period should be exposed to either Trigard or either Lumivert. And those are the two products that are doing uh, the most work at, for controlling our maggot populations. So theoretically, that should slow down the evolution of resistance to either Trigard or Lumivert. Okay, so that's um, pretty much it. Um, I always like to talk a little bit about uh, a fantasy world, <laughs> and that would be to design an insecticide resistance management strategy that would be more um, landscape dependent. So in other words, rather than having four or five different growers all with their own insecticide resistance management strategies and rotations, that everybody would say, okay, you know what? 2023, we're gonna use the far more FI 500 package with Trigard. And then in 2024, we're gonna use Lumivert or something like that. I know that it, it, there's a lot of reasons why that won't work. However, I can see a huge benefit and that it would really delay the onset of resistance to either of those products. Okay, enough about maggots. Um, I guess I, I'll summarize real quickly what I said, but um, consider seed treatments that will control both maggot species. Again, uh, makes a lot of sense. Best seed treatment options are Lumiverd and Trigard. Annually rotate the Trigard and Lumiverd to mitigate resistance development. And then certainly, uh, as I just showed you, there is future needs for research that will identify new active ingredients and combinations. Okay, now I'm gonna transition to thrips. And here's some classic thrips damage on the right, where both the adults and the immatures will feed on the foliage, remove the chlorophyll, and this can reduce bulb weight up to 60% in some cases. I don't know about you all, but we see this very commonly where you have a field that matures earlier than one that's next to it. So in this case, there is uh, some transplanted fields that matured earlier. All the surviving thrips in that field flew across this road into this uh, less mature field and almost overnight turned those plants white. 
I call it a thrip tsunami <laughs> because it's a wave of thrips that go into the field and will feed on those plants. And one thing that I hope you all don't have, and that's iris yellow spot virus, which is transmitted by onion thrips. It's a tospo virus. If those plants get infected with it on the early side, they can die standing up like you can see here. And um, not only can this re reduce bulb weight and size classes, but it'll make these plants more vulnerable to bacterial pathogens because they're dying standing up. Now, in New York, we can have a number of different generations of thrips. So this little diagram shows our season in green, the time that thrips show up, which could be any time in June, all the way through sometime in early September. Um, and depending on when that crop is harvested, you could have just one generation of thrips completed or as many as four generations. The generations do overlap even probably more than what this illustration shows. But the point is that you can have between one and four generations of thrips in a field before it's harvested. So we do have products that are effective for managing thrips. And here are some of the more commonly ones that are used in New York. They include ag Agrimec, which is abimectin, Exeril, which is cyanotronilaprol, Minecto Pro, which is a premix of abimectin and cyanotronilaprol. We have Movento, which is spirotetramat, Senstar, also spirotetramat, with a, a little bit of pyroproxifen in there, which really doesn't do anything. That's really a white fly product. We don't have white flies and onions. Um, so it, it's it's really, uh, well, anyway. Um, and then finally, we have Radiant, which is spinetaram. So I have also indicated the different classes here. And the good thing is we have one, two, three, four classes represented. Remember, this one is a mix of these two. And then basically, Senstar and Movento are the same. So we do have four different classes to rotate with to try to mitigate resistance. That's a good thing. And in terms of either on the label um, or what's suggested is that you really shouldn't use any one of these products more than twice. And when you use them, use them back to back. Um, and again, the idea here is that that would reduce selection pressure on a particular population to develop resistance. So probably the last time that I spoke to you all, I talked a little bit about the onion thrips management guidelines. They haven't changed a lot, um, but they have changed a bit. And I'll, I'll try to go through it a little bit quickly. If I go through it too quickly and it's like, man, I would love to see that again. Um, I intend, well, probably some of this is up on one of my websites, but I can certainly uh, provide this to Kevin and he can distribute this, this uh, presentation. At any rate, what we start with is Movento or Senstar uh, because it's systemic. It works really, really well. We time it when there's about 0.6 to 1 thrips per leaf or right before pre-bulbing because it's so, so darn effective that we really need it on every acre of our onions. But you can't spray it late because it won't work well. So you got to spray it early. That's why we start with it. I've also shown from my research over the years that two applications are always better than one. And to separate those applications by seven to 10 days. Okay, so after that, you scout the field a week after that second spray, and you may have three different options then to follow. And those options are based on the density of thrips in that field. Oftentimes what we'll see after two applications of Movento or Senstar, that a week after that second application, the population is really low, so low that you don't even need to spray anything. Sometimes it can go two weeks and even once in a while, three weeks. But at some point that population of thrips will go up and there will need to be some action taken. If that population is relatively low, we have found that something like Agrimec is a good choice. All right. Um, again, if the population is maybe 0.8 to 1 thrips per leaf, if it's a little higher, let's say 1 to 2 or maybe even 1 to almost 3, Minecto Pro could be a good option. And then finally, if the population seems to be getting away from us, then a high rate of radiant seems to work out pretty well. Now, real quick, you see this dash line here. Well, that's if you use Agrimec, you think uh, I can control it with Agrimec, it's inexpensive, and I'll take care of my thrips. And guess what? Your thrips population goes up the following week. You want to use something a little stronger. You can then use Minecto Pro. 
again, this has abamectin. Both of these products have ab abamectin in them. And then after a double application of one of these different options, then you can finish up with either Exeril, Radiant, if you start with Agrimac, because again, that way you're not um, using the same active ingredient more than uh, twice in a particular season. With Minecto Pro, you could either use Radiant or a LAN 8 plus Warrior Combo. And then if you use Radiant in the middle here, you could either go with LAN 8 plus Warrior or Exeril. Okay, that's all I really wanna talk about. Again, I can provide this if you can't find it online. Um, it's worked really, really well for our growers or some version of this. So are there any new insecticides for thrips control? No, there is not, unfortunately, but I was able to look at some new active ingredients last year in a project that was sponsored by our IR4 program. That's a governmental supported program. The project was on green onions or scallions, not on bulb onions. And it was conducted in three different states, including New York, it was my location. And I'll share with you that uh, project now. So we had, um, let's see, five different treatments. We had Radiant, which is Spinetaram. We had Harvanta, which is Cyclonilaprol, which is a close cousin to Exeril. It's a class uh, 28, it's a diamide. We have Planazlin technology, which I just talked about was effective as a seed treatment. Have it in here as a foliar spray. And then uh, Spear T, which is a peptide, and then Savanto Prime, which is Flupidiferone, um, or Pyridiferone, which is a class 4D. Um, like I said, these were conducted on scallions, and we used a, a variety of scallion, which grew like a leek. It was a monster scallion. Um, and here are some of the plots just to see. These are scallions, and these are bulb onions. They are much, much bigger than our bulb onions. Uh, Thrips liked them all the same. And here are those results. Um, these are the number of Thrips um, larvae, total ones uh, per plant on three consecutive sampling dates. So there are three applications and three sampling dates, and here are the totals. So in the untreated control, there were a little over 100. We see the spear T, which was worse. I think they must have preferred spear T. <laughs> um, and then we see that radiant, our standard, worked really, really well. Not a big surprise. This was it. Um, and then uh, Harvanta, not quite as good, but it did work. Planazla technology, which was incredible. Uh, I've looked at this for probably four or five years straight now, and it's always been one of the best treatments in my trials. And then finally, Savanto Prime, which worked fairly well, um, which is great because, again, it belongs to a new a class of chemistry that isn't currently used on onions for thrips control. So that was the one that I was most excited about. I already knew about planazolin technology. Syngenta intends to uh, register it um, on onion for thrips control. So I kind of knew that was in the pipeline. Everything's going well with that one. But this is the, the real promising. So Savanto um, works really well against thrips. Uh, the good news is that, um, that it's going to be put on the onion label for thrips control. The bad thing is it may take one or two years for that to happen. But so the good news is that maybe in a couple of years, we'll have the planazolin technology and Savanto, two new classes of chemistry for thrips control that work really well. So just to summarize, uh, the Savanto Prime, um, you know, evaluated at least two different rates on bulb onions is what I want to do um, this year. Planazolin technology, um, again, I think it's time to really look at how it might fit into a season long program. And uh, I intend to do that as well this year. So just in summary then, I'd like to consider um, that you can uh, think about the onion thrips management guidelines to not only optimize thrips control, but also to mitigate the possibility of resistance. Um, and that, to do that, use a sequence of products, ideally apply a product no, no more than two times and use them consecutively. Use an action threshold of about one thrips per leaf to optimize the number of sprays um, and then finally, the future research plan to evaluate these new active ingredients and in season long sequences. So I'd like to thank um, the folks in my program that have helped out with all this research. Uh, collaborators, Christy Hopetain, Ethan Grunberg and Al Taylor, a number of different funding sources. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's time. Any questions?
Just wondering if you had any observations on broflanolide on onion maggot. Yes, I have. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I had an opportunity to evaluate broflanolide um, as a seed treatment and as an infero application. And um, it was very, very effective. Uh, the first year was a rate that um, BASF thought would, I, I'm not sure how they calculated it, but I think there was an error in calculation and it was a rate that was a bit higher than they would likely go with. Um, and, and it worked really well. The following year used a, a rate that was a bit lower. It also worked incredibly well. Um, it failed miserably as an infro drench. Uh, which just sometimes baffles me. And it's not the only product. I've seen that with Planazolin technology. I've seen it with other products where it works really well as a seed treatment, but not as an infrared drench at planting. Um, and I, I just don't know why. Uh, maybe it has something to do with the muck soil, the timing of maggots to the timing of the application. Anyway, regardless, broflanolide is great. Unfortunately, I was told by BASF, at least in the United States, that they were not interested in pursuing it as a C treatment on, on onion. So um, I hope that stance changes <laughs> because it's it's really effective against uh, onion maggot. Any other questions? Well, we got them. Okay, thanks very much, Brian. You're very welcome. Have a good afternoon. All right, our last speaker, Sean Jantz. Um, before he starts, I'd like to thank our sponsors again, who paid for all this to happen. Uh, Alliance AgriTurf, FMC, Stoke Seeds, Bear, BSF, Homes Agro, and Syngenta, and Corteva. Sorry, Helena, I forgot Corteva. Okay, thank you, and thank you for hanging in there. Well, last speaker, we'll get through this, hopefully, and we'll off, off our long weekend. So today I'm going to talk about our onion variety trials that we conducted in 2022. So we did both yellow and red. So I'm going to talk about both of them. I'm going to start off with the yellows to begin. Uh, I seeded it on May 6th and 7th. We had 36 cultivars from nine different companies. We pulled them on September 13th and 14th. We took the yield samples. We topped them on the 23rd, so about 10 days later. And I did the evaluations from the 28th of November to the 14th of December. As far as the trial goes as a whole, uh, germination and vigor was fair. I wouldn't say it was outstanding. They were okay. I was sort of pleased with them. Growth was steady and satisfactory through the whole entire growing season. Uh, plant stands thinned in a couple of varieties. We did have a few varieties where the stand dramatically dropped way down. Uh, insects were kept at pretty manageable levels. Thrips didn't really become much of an issue, and we'll see some comments on onion maggot in a bit. Leaf diseases also were at pretty manageable levels. Uh, I know Mary Ruth was talking about downy mildew. There was a couple of times when there was a couple thoughts that it could become an issue. I did put a couple of protective sprays on. Stemphilium as a whole kind of followed IPM recommendations, and it was also pretty much kept at a very manageable level. Uh, and I did see a few cedars though this year pop up in, in the variety trial in a few varieties. As far as the yields were concerned, they were fair but there was differences between the reps. So we do three reps for this trial. And statistically, I found differences between each of the reps. Rep one having the best yields and rep three having the lowest yields overall. Uh, stand counts were at 6.6 .6 a foot. Uh, the most common call was a peewee or undersized. Uh, they had good neck finishes this year. So they, they did fully mature all the way through. Uh, color again for about the third or fourth year now has been really good. And the skin quality this year was good, but I still think uh, 2021 had a little better skin quality. As far as some averages from the trials, as mentioned, sort of 6.6 .6 onions per foot, pretty much equal to what I've seen the last few years. Uh, the bushels per acre actually was up a little bit, even with a couple of varieties that were on the poor side, I still had some decent uh, yield. The onion maggot damage was only 1.6%. So, and that was a drop in half. Last year it was 3%. I think this is really a, a good sign of the Spinosad and the um, Evergo Prime combination really at work here, big time. So, because I had a couple of varieties that didn't have some things, but I'll talk about that in a bit. Uh, days to harvest was only 103. So it was down a little bit from the year before. Firmness, pretty much the same, 8.3 which is still quite decent, it's quite firm. And the score was 7.15, or the qualities was up a little bit. 
As far as percent marketable goes, the trial average was 89.3. It was equals what we saw in 2021. It ranged from 97 to 76. Half the trial was higher than 90%, so pretty decent. And again, the number one issue, oops, the number one issue was more or less peewees was the number one call. The top six varieties as far as percent marketable goes, the number one was Catskill, second was Traverse, Traverse uh, from 97 and 97%, LaSalle, and a number of varieties from Hazera at uh, 37, 120. This is the second year that LaSalle and this number of variety were in the top six as far as percent marketable goes from the variety trial. Uh, switchback and another number of variety from Hazera, 37, 126. And again, second year that switchback was in the top six as far as percent marketable goes in the, in the yellow main trial. Looking at yield, so the trial average again was 1,054. It actually was up by 100 compared to the 2021 trial, but still this number should be a little higher than that we should see, but it was what it was. It ranged from 1,376, although some varieties we could see too had very low level at 383. Approximately half the trial was above 1,100, so reasonable. Uh, it was basically a 50-50 split in size ranges. Um, half of the varieties, more or less, the majority fell in the three to two and a half range. And sort of the other half of varieties, the majority of the onions fell in the two and a half to two inch range. So you can see some slight differences in sizes there. The top six varieties as far as yield goes, um, number one was a uh, number of variety from Seminus, 1496. And this is the fourth year that has been in the top top six as far as yield goes from being in the variety trials. So obviously it's a producer. Lodestar from Tacky at 1,371. Overlook and Ridgeline, Overlook from Seminus, Ridgeline from Tacky, again. And Catskill and Sumo. So only that one variety was a repeat from last year. And of course it's been a repeat for about four years now into that top six, so something there. Looking at the jumbos, at anything greater than three inches in diameter, the top varieties and the percentage, the trial average was about 16%, which was about up 4% compared to the previous last year's um, variety trial. But the top ones were Ridgeline, and it's the third year that Ridgeline also has been within this top five, six, top six, I should say. Uh, a number of variety from Hazara, 20, 126. A uh, number of variety from Zara, 120. Milestone, Scorpion, and 1496. And some of these numbers you can see too were in that higher percent marketable range and also in some of the higher yield range. So some of the more um, better yields and a little better quality onions are kind of shining through here. Looking at quality. So when I'm doing quality or score, I'm looking at the uniformity, the shape and size, skin thickness, attachment of that skin, the color of the skin, neck finish, and just a sort of an overall rating of the onion. The trial average was 7.15, good. Again, I, this year quality seemed quite well from what I when I did the evaluations. And it ranged from 8.13, very good, just to average at 6.23. So the varieties that had the best score, best qualities, Lodestar from Tacky was sort of the best, very nice, something like you're kind of seeing on the screen there. You know, uniformity of shape, nice sizes, neck finish is good, skin attachment's good, thicker skin on it, all that type of thing. Frontier, which is quite often in that range also at 7.96. Oneida from Beijo, Safrain, Dawson, and Gunnison at 7.67. So all with good quality, uh, good quality yellow cooking onion. Looking at onion maggot damage, as I mentioned, the trial average was only 1.15. It was a decrease of half. Last year it was 3%. So this is sort of the second year that we've had the vast majority of the varieties with the it is spinosad, I'm saying that right, right? Suppresto, thank you, thank you, Tyler. Suppresto, not spinosad, or take that back. Suppresto and Evergo Prime. And I had some maggot damage and some thinning out there, as I mentioned. I went back to look and see if it was a variety that maybe didn't have that combination, it was something else, but that didn't follow through. So I think it was more of a, a seed issue as far as maybe quality of maturity or something happened during the treatment of it that made some of those varieties a little poorer. But the varieties that had absolutely no onion maggot damage, and when this is the stuff that I've harvested, I put it out on the table and I look at every onion just to see anything from a pin mark of onion maggot feeding to completely an unmarkable bulb. 
So I'm doing the whole entire range. So Scorpion, Valencia, Mountaineer, Saddleback, Overlook, and Oneida were the best varieties and all of them basically being zero to only half a percent damage in there. And even then the varieties that had the highest amount of damage, it I guess I shouldn't say really wasn't that bad, but 6.4 for Dawson, uh, Modella, Crockett, a number of varieties from Harris 118, and Braddock, basically about 5 to 3%. So very reasonable. Obviously, it's a Presto, and Evergo Prime is doing a very good job out there. So there was no Lores ban, no dithane applied to this type at all. It was just bare, uh, bare pelleted seed popped into the ground. I'll move on now to the onion storage trial. So the onion storage trial is actually the 2021 onions that were harvested. We had 47 varieties and they were in storage about 44 weeks. As far as trial average goes, the percent marketable this year was only 55. It was down about 11% compared to what the 2020 onions stored at. Uh, the weight loss was up uh, to 9.6 on average, up about a, a percent and a half from 2020. Sprouting was almost almost 30 percent 29 percent it was up eight percent compared to 2020 i found lower amounts of rot were found so there was less rot this year than what i saw in 2020 but yet all these are are in the in the wrong trend firmness was average and one third of the onions had sprouting on the top and the root so what i mean by that is usually in the onion trial, I see either sort of root sprouts starting, the basal plate pushing out and small root, root sprouts out there, or I see actual top sprout popping out of the bulb. Not, not usually a combination of both. This year, about one third of the onions had the combination of the both. So they lost that dormancy, I think a little earlier, and, I, and it's obviously coming through in the lower percent markable that we saw. And I don't, I, they were all treated with Royal MH as always. So I don't know what happened there, but obviously this year, the, the 2021 onions didn't store quite the same way as I've seen in the past with some of the varieties. Looking at percent marketable. So the top six varieties was LaSalle at 78%, Sat1 from Seminova at 76, and the second year that it's been in the top six. Coming out of storage, Stanley from Clifton at 76, Crockett from Bejo at 75, Safrain from Bejo, second year for them in the top six again, and Heracchio from Herzera at 71%. So those are ones, a couple of those names are not surprising, I'm sure. We all know Stanley's a pretty good storage onion, and some of the other names there too have got some storage quality. Looking at the ones that had the lowest percent, so this is obviously the type of ones that you harvest and you move along fairly quickly. They're the early maturing type of thing, but Elsie from Enzazetta, only 16%. And you can kind of see that's all that was anything of good markable. The rest had rot, or you can see here all the sprouting that's occurring. And Scout from Crookham at 13%. So, of course, our variety trial contains everything from early maturing to late maturing onions. So we're going to have some varieties that are a little poorer on the storage trial. Looking at sprouts, the trial average was about 30, uh, 29%. That, is, again, is up compared to what I have seen. But the ones that had the lowest amount of sprouting, which this is kind of very surprising because we think of Highlander, it's not a storage onion. But I will say this, it didn't store well, it just didn't have many sprouts. It had more rot, skin issues, softness. That's where it lost all of its markability. So, but it had, I was, I, this morning before I even put this together, when I put it together, this morning, I looked at it last night and I was like, there must be something wrong there. I got to double check that this morning, but no, it is right. So it only had, uh, it had sprouting of only 5.5%, but really let's focus on these guys here. Horatio, LaSalle, Crockett, and Stanley are the varieties that had the least amount of sprouting. Uh, Horatio third year in a row that it's been in that low, low uh, sprouting in occurrence, keeping the numbers low, but even Stanley was almost at 10%. So again, storage trial didn't store the greatest. Looking at weight loss, the ones that lost the least amount of weight, trial average was about nine and a half percent. If you were here yesterday, I was mentioning too the carrots trial, we had a higher amount of weight loss occurring, similar, similar in the onions too this, this of this past year from the 2021 season. But Sat1, LaSalle, Sumo, the number of variety from Seminus 1496 and Catskill were the varieties that had the least amount, basically 7% to 8% weight loss. 
at, at the max. Firmness, how hard or how solid is the onion still? Again, some of the varieties that we're very used to seeing in this, their Crockett was a number one at 8.3, still quite firm, quite solid. And it's a fourth year that has been in the top five for firmness coming out of storage. Stanley, Patterson, Mondella, and Herecchio from uh, Hazera, all again. And the trial average was, actually the firmness was decent coming out of storage. So at 6.7, that's still pretty good. Normally we see more closer to a five or a high five to a very low six. So then we also, that's, that's a storage trial. We also did uh, work on red onions. So for this year or for, for last year, for 2022, it was the first year I actually did direct seeded red onions. After some discussion with seed companies, we had been doing transplants and a lot of the seed companies were saying, no, let's, they would kind of prefer seeing it being a direct seeded because they feel the varieties are getting to the point where they can mature within our season without too much issue and get up to good size and have a full mature neck in that. So we switched over last year to direct seeding instead. So some of the points and highlights from it, uh, we seeded on May 6th and 7th. So we basically started with the red and we pushed right through into the yellow and came back on the yellow and finished the red and we just kind of zigzagged ourselves back and forth. So we seeded them both on the same day. We had 16 cultivars last year that went into the red trial from seven different companies. Uh, pulled them the same time, 14th and 15th, topped them on the 23rd, uh, did the evaluations from the 31st of October to the 4th of November. Some of the uh, highlights or the points from that variety trial of the reds, uh, germination and vigor was fair, very similar to what I saw in the yellows. Uh, the only difference was where we seeded the reds the ground was uh, a bit wetter at seeding than what it was in the yellows. I had some concern on that, but in the end, uh, as far as what I saw, it didn't make a huge difference, but it was one of those deals. The weather wasn't hundred percent great before we seeded. The land wasn't hundred percent ready, but it was time to get going and we kind of plugged them in. So that's why it was a little bit on the wet side there. Uh, the entire season, the growth was steady, very similar to the yellows. The trial, there was no stop or stall or restart up in the growth. Leaf diseases started early, but again, kept at manageable levels. Uh, though there was a little more leaf damage, a little more, we saw a little more stemphilium type of damage in the reds than we did in the yellows. And in the reds also, there was a few cedars again too. Uh, as a whole, there was average yields. Uh, low amount of rot, um, com especially compared to 2021, where there was a fair bit of skin rot in the reds. There were a lower number of jumbos or three inch onions. So for my, compared to from transplant, I'm kind of dealing with transplant for the last four or five years and then going to seeding just this year, we saw a little lower level of, of jumbos. Stand counts were 6.8. Uh, neck finishes were good. They matured and skin quality was pretty good too. I actually we think the skin quality probably bumped up a bit from doing from transplants to direct seeded. As far as some trial averages, again, six onions, 6.8 onions a foot. The marketable average for bushels was 1234, which was an increase compared to the transplants. There was only 1.8% onion maggot damage in it, just a titch more than what we saw in the yellows. And again, the vast majority, Suppresto and Evergo Prime treated, took just a little bit longer to mature. Not surprising, reds do usually take a few more days at 107, up a little bit compared to the transplants. Again, not surprising, transplants mature a little quicker. Firmness at 8.4, they were a little firmer. And score for quality was an average of 7.11. Looking at percent marketable, the trial average was about 90, well, 91.6. It ranged from 98 to 76 and a half. Half the trial was higher than 93, so quite reasonable. Calls. The majority of the calls were doubles in the reds. There was a little bit of rot and there was a few undersize. The top six varieties, as far as percent marketable goes in the red trial, uh, number of variety from Hazara, 8140 at 98%. Rubellin from Taki at 70 or 97.3. Ruby Ring and Red Carpet, both of them have been in the top five for the last, sorry, have been in the top six for the last five years at 96.8 and 95.7. Red Wing and Tanat. So Red Wing from Bejo at 94.9 and Tanat from NZZ at 94.5. In the second year that Red Wing's been up there a bit. Looking at yield, trial average again was 1234. 
It increased by 200 uh, bushels per acre from 2021. So doing the direct seeded, we saw more yield, but remember I saw less three inch onions. So, so the numbers were there, it's just they didn't necessarily size for it all the way. Range from 1447 to one variety being on the poor side at 6, 614. Approximately half the trial was about 1200 or more. Uh, top six varieties as far as yield go from those 16 in the red onion variety trial. Red Nugent was number one at 1447. Uh, red Bull from Beijo at 1443. Red Wing at 1439. The 4643 from Stokes at 1438. And that's five years that it's been in the top six for yield. Uh, red Carpet from Beijo at 1420. And a number of varieties from Seminus 1608 at 1377. So those are the varieties of those 16. Those are the top six as far as yield is concerned. Looking at jumbos or three inch onions, the top varieties that had the vast majority, the trial average was only 27.7. It was down just shy of 5% compared to what we had when we were doing them as transplants. So not too bad. They did size fairly decent. Uh, the number one variety was uh, number variety 8140 from Hazer at 55% of the onions being at least three inches or greater in diameter. 4643, fourth year that it's in that top range. Red Nugent, fourth year again for it too at 47 and 41. Red Wing, Red Carpet, and Bolero at 37 through to 32% of the onions in the three inch diameter or greater range. As far as scores, again, same things that we're looking at in the yellow variety trials, except we also add into here internal color too, not just exterior color. The trial average was 7.11, it, it was good. It ranged from 8.15, very good, to 6.4 average. Top in score or quality, Redstone was number one from Hazara at 8.15, Rebellion from Taki at 7.85, Comrade from Clifton, 7.7, .7. Ruby Ring, and Red Mountain in there. And again, trial average 7.11. I would say too, the skins this year on the reds, um, I found just some slight cracking at that point in time when I did the evaluation, there wasn't a lot. And the transplants, when I did them, I probably found more skin cracking in that. So they seem to, the, the seed, it seemed to hold together a little bit better with skins. And it might've also just been the year. Looking at the interior color, wanting, of course, those real nice red rings right to the dead center, if at all possible. So the variety that had the best interior color was a number variety from Enza Zeta at 10441 at nine. So that one was literally red right into that last little tiny bit there, a nice red ring. Uh, Rebellion from Taki, Red Bull, Red Stone, and Comrade, and the trial average was 7.2. There was two or three varieties that it probably was into about the one, two, third ring or so was just pure white, I saw in some of the seeded stuff. Most of the time with the transplants, they were red all the way through. But this year with some of the seeded, there was a two or three varieties that there was a fair, fair chunk of white in the center, which of course you don't want to have. You want to have nice red all the way through. And there was one variety that when I cut it, that color all the way through all the rings bled through too. That's in the green book or the comments on that. So anyhow, as I just mentioned, all there's a lot more information on the variety trial in the reds in the green book. The last third of the book, of course, is covering all the variety trials, the carrots, the yellow onions, and the red onions. So please take that home. Take some time to look through. And there's lots of comments on through the evaluation, through the storage, and, and, and just the information on all the ratings of quality and things like that. And as I mentioned yesterday, don't forget, we have a website. All the old green books are on there. Research, re research reports, IPM updates are on there. So please take some time to take a look at there and gather anything that you may need. Um, Jeff and then mentioned, did you guys do a video today? Yep. Yeah, okay. So robots today? Okay, so yeah, we got our uh, Muck Crops IPM YouTube channel now. And as, as Todd just mentioned, there's a video there that Jeff took in California, Jeff and Kevin. But all the robot work. There's some new tutorials for IPM pro practices. Uh, the old variety trials are on. This conference is going to be on there. So take a look at that. And we also have Twitter if you follow, if you have Twitter account. And that's more, again, geared to short bursts of information that might be important. Onion maggot flies are really high north end of, uh, of the Hollow Marsh. 
we just found some downy mildew in the marsh. Uh, my conference is going to be in two days. Don't forget, guys. Stuff like that. So a little burst of information. And of course, as yesterday, as I mentioned, uh, Mishko has been here for working with me. I believe it's 12 years and he has retired now. So we're losing someone of great value to me. But I do thank him for all the work that he did. And he is a reason why we have success with the variety trials. Much appreciated. And this past summer, we had Samantha Share as our summer student. She was great, very helpful also in gathering all the information from the storage trials and some of the heights and other information we took out in the field. So appreciate their help. And then just to finish off, uh, as far as go, we want to thank our tech team. Kevin and Jeff really worked hard. Tyler and Dennis also given helping hand to make sure we could do all this with the live feed and how we set up here and everything. So they help with the setup assistance of the speakers, the sound projection, the online Zoom, how all that works. I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I want to thank our growers for coming out and participating. It's very much appreciated. Uh, we, hope, we hope you got something beneficial out of the last two days. I want to thank our sponsors. We've gone through them all here before, but again, they really kind of help pay for the lunch and some of the, of the door prizes and things like that. So we wish you well this growing season. We hope it's successful. Don't forget we're here. Don't forget to talk to Tyler about signing up for integrated pest management if you haven't yet. Get that said and done. And uh, we're here if you need us in the coming growing season. So, and hopefully a successful one. So thank you.